is, so they're hearing an echo. So, um, but so uh, for achieving the dream, uh, we're going to focus on single working mothers who are living in poverty. So we're going to work on that for the next three years. But um, so I, I want to um, begin by, um, I think, sharing a little bit of a story and, and talking about uh, why this is important for, I think, many of us. And um, we teach women like this in our classrooms. We teach um, these uh, children of these women. And so many of us are invested in the success of these students. And so I'm going to share that I am a product of a woman who was a, a single um, mother who um, had to work two jobs, um, earning minimum wage. She worked actually two full-time jobs. She worked uh, one uh, in the morning. She went to work at six o'clock in the morning and at a restaurant, she could uh, cook and bake anything from scratch. And um, so, um, so she, um, she went to that job six o'clock in the morning. She worked that one breakfast and lunch. She finished with that one at two o'clock. Then she went to um, a sewing uh, factory and we lived in King, North Carolina at the time. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that area. It's near Winston-Salem. And then she went to uh, a sewing factory there and she worked uh, there from three until 11. And so my sister, I took care of my sister. And this is a picture of my mother and my younger sister and me. And we grew up in the 70s. And if you grew up during that time period, you probably recognize those crocheted ponchos. Um, many of us had those. <laughs> but the clothes we are wearing, my mother sewed all of those. She could sew anything. And in fact, um, when I um, was, <laughs> yes, you had one too. Many of us had those. So um, when uh, my mother can make anything, she could sew anything. That's why she was able to get a job at a sewing factory. And um, when I got ready to get married, in fact, I was, we were not very wealthy. And so um, my mother made my wedding gown and uh, hand uh, sewed all of the pearls on it, everything I wanted on it, she did it. But uh, so uh, my mother, she worked her, her job. So um, I, because she, we were poor, we were really poor. Uh, she couldn't afford childcare. So I was the one who uh, took care of my sister. And we didn't have a lot of food. We didn't have uh, clothes, depending upon the season. We had maybe two outfits. We didn't have um, soap. We didn't have shampoo. We didn't have things to wash our clothes with. Uh, I can remember um, this specific memory for some reason sticks out in my mind. Um, we would go to school a lot um, smelling because we didn't have anything. Um, to wash our clothes with, to bathe with. And for some reason we had some powder, some baby powder. And I can remember taking our clothes and sprinkling the baby powder on it, hoping that it would take the smell away, but it, it didn't do anything. But I can remember the kids making fun of us. Um, you know, it was, it was not a good thing. Um, so, my mother at some point was able to save up enough money to make a down payment on a used trailer in a, a trailer park in King. Um, it was not by any means a nice trailer, but it was, it was somewhere for us to live. And she was really proud of that. So we moved in. And at that point, um, I, I was in the sixth grade, my sister was in the second grade, and she was still working both of her full-time jobs, minimum wage. And so I'm taking care of my sister. 
and you know we're we're going about our lives doing what we have to do and i can remember one day we come home the bus pulls up in front of the trailer park and the trailer is gone and so i look at the the bus driver nothing's there but the concrete steps and so i look at the bus driver and i'm looking at this adult i'm in the sixth grade my second grade sister is behind me and i'm looking at this adult you know looking for guidance you know what am i supposed to do and this adult woman looks at me and she says, I don't know what you're supposed to do, but you have to get off the bus because I have other people to um, I have these kids I have to take home. So we get off the bus and the only thing I know to do is to go. We sit on the concrete steps. There's no way for me to get in touch with my mother. Um, we didn't have cell phones then. You know, I'm really old. Uh, <laughs> we didn't have cell phones. And at that point, I can remember um, my mom had told us, do not call me at work because I will get fired. And so this is in the back of my mind, too. So I knew not to go to the neighbors and try to call her. You know, I'm a six. I'm in the sixth grade. So that's in my mind, too. And so we just sit on concrete steps until it gets dark and a neighbor comes and lets us come into our house until um, my mom gets home. And she doesn't get home, you know, she gets off work at 11. So it's pretty late when she gets home. So I share this story with you because um, my mother is not an anomaly. There are a lot of women like this um, across our country. And there are women like this in our classrooms. And, um, you know, there are children of these women in our classrooms. And so what Jason and I are going to uh, talk to you about today is how do we help these women get some kind of credential to help them get out of these situations so that, you um, once they are find themselves homeless, because we were homeless after this, we, we lived in the car for um, a couple of weeks, um, but um, my mom still made us go to school. We still went to school and King is a small town. Everybody knew what happened. And yes, the kids are cruel. Uh, making fun of us. They were calling us, we went to school, they called us the white trash and made fun of the way we smelled, all this kind of stuff. But the adults knew what was going on. They're cruel too. Adults can be really cruel. So um, this is one of the reasons I'm, I'm very passionate about helping the students uh, in, our, in this kind of situation. Okay, so let's talk about what's going on. All right, so we have this dichotomy in our state in particular. All right, so um, let's talk about that. So in North Carolina in particular, you probably know um, in US News and World Report, every year, North Carolina in, is one of the best places in the country to move and live. And that's because of all of these places, all of these, um, it, uh, these factors, desirability, the value, job market, quality of life, and the net uh, migration. These are the factors that they, they use to determine. Raleigh Durham is at the top of the list usually. Uh, Charlotte is in there sometimes, um, not sometimes, usually in the top uh, of the list. Uh, Winston-Salem, Greensboro sometimes. Um, but this time this year, uh, Raleigh Durham is number two, the best places to live, number 22, best places to retire, number 23, and uh, fastest growing places. And that's because of um, you have, I mean, it's wonderful in this area. We have all of the surrounding universities, we have RTP, we have um, UNC and Duke Healthcare, a lot of opportunities here in this area. But then there's this other side. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Oxfam study that came out 
uh, uh, I guess about two months ago. And uh, Oxfam is a nonprofit organization that focuses on poverty in um, this country as well as, oh, well, as well as DC and Puerto Rico. And so they talk about, they focus on a lot of different areas in regard to poverty. One of the things in particular that they focus on is single working moms. Um, and this year they determined that North Carolina is the worst place for single working mothers who earn minimum wage to live if, uh, in regard to all 50 states, in addition to Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico. And so, and what happens is, and this is what came out of the study. Let's see, this is what they said. And this is what they determined. Wage policies, worker protections, rights to organize, and tipped wages. So, uh, and this is based on the MIT, uh, MIT living wage calculator. And so um, this is pretty bad for us. And so if we think about the women uh, in our surrounding communities, we have 58 community colleges. We need to be reaching out to these women and figuring out how we can get them some kind of credential that gets them a living wage so that they can get out of poverty, okay? So based on this study, here's what they found. A single mother earning minimum wage would have to work 80 hours per week to support a family of four in North Carolina. Now, I can attest to this because my mother was one of these women. Now, granted that was a, a few years ago, but it hasn't changed a lot, okay? So, and this is today, this is 2021, a single mother, 80 hours a week. So how do we support a woman who's having to work this many hours to get a credential? And this is what we are trying to figure out to do, okay? So we have to look at some, some of the data in order to make those kinds of decisions. So the 2019 living income standard. So in North Carolina, in order to make ends meet in North Carolina, to pay your bills, to pay your rent, to be able to buy food for your family, to be able to pay things like your electricity, just to have basic living, you would need uh, to be able for a family of four, two people working, you would have to earn around $53,000, okay? Two people working, earning minimum wage, you're going to earn about $30,000, however. Uh, the federal poverty line is $24,300. And this is according to uh, the North Carolina Justice uh, Organization. And you can go to this uh, website and look up. They have all kinds of data on there that you might find very interesting in regard to North Carolina. Okay, next. Now, let's look at women's earnings in North Carolina in regard to males. Now, we know that uh, women especially still are struggling to earn um, in regard to equal pay. Um, this is something that's still, um, I, I, I guess, disturbing. And uh, the first day that Obama was um, in office, he signed the Ledbetter Act, and that was uh, the Equal Pay Act. And um, we still are not where we need to be. That was, you know, think about the first day Obama was in office. So this is North Carolina. And you look at uh, this, um, white men, a dollar, and then all women, 83 cents, Asian women, 84 cents, and you can go down. White women, 80 cents, black women, 63. And, and then you look at, you know, a Latina women, 50 cents on the dollar, this is North Carolina. Uh, 
So this is why we see so many um, single working mothers living in poverty. Still, in 2021, this is 2019, it hasn't changed in two years. Especially in the pandemic, it's even you know, more, you're seeing more women living in poverty. Okay. Okay, so how do we assist single working mothers acquire credentials that help them earn living wages? So we have some ideas. So in our classrooms, at the collegiate level, and at the state level. So we came up with some ideas and here's what we think we can do overall. All right. So um, in the classroom, one of the most important things based on research, we know this, all right? You must build positive relationships with your students. There's no way around it. If you don't build the positive relationships with your students, they will not come to you when they need help. That's it, okay? That's the number one thing. You have to build these positive relationships. Um, I attended one of the Achieving the Dream conferences and one of the, the speakers there, the, the student speaker said, we know when you care and when you don't care. So that's important, okay? Uh, the next thing, consider exceptions for attendance. Now, this doesn't mean that you let, uh, uh, that you let your students miss class all the time. What this means is if your student, your, uh, well, this could be any student, but if your working mother says to you, I don't have childcare for my, to come to class today, or I don't have, the money to buy gas to come to class today, um, then you need to understand that there's something going on there and they're going to be able to tell you these things based on the relationships that you've built. So you need to understand that, okay, there's something going on. I need to step in and figure out what I need to do to help this student. So that doesn't mean that you're all the time giving this student um, extra, you know, extra assistance and, and not letting that student, you know, take responsibility. It's understanding that, okay, this mother is trying to get out of poverty. How am I going to help this student and, and understand in the process what is going on? Okay. So next. All right, wraparound services. So what do I mean by wraparound services? So I'm sure that uh, your colleges have wraparound services. So for us at Vance Grandma, we have a ton of uh, options available for wraparound services. And so we have the food pantry. This is one of the things that was so important to me because um, when we were in our situation, we just did not have access to food. Um, one of the, I, my, I can remember coming home from school and we, you know, just my sister would be hungry. We did not have food. Um, I can remember eating croutons. I found croutons for her. We just didn't have it. And my mother, I mean, it was what it was. Um, um, so we have to be able to give them food. We need to be able to. Um, to give them if um, they are going to, they can't pay their rent, they're going to be evicted. We need to be able to offer them some kind of financial support so they can pay their rent. If the uh, internet is going to be cut off, we need to be able that they have access to their internet because they can't complete their services if they don't have access to internet. Uh, we need to be able, um, if their electricity is going to be turned off, we have to make sure that they have access to that kind of um, those utilities. If they don't have gas to get to school, uh, if they don't have transportation, our president at Vance Granville, that was one of the things that was extremely important to her. And so she has made it possible 
for our students to be able to get transportation from their homes to all four campuses and back home um, to their classes. All right. So that has made a difference for many of our students. Um, and so there are a lot of things in regard to wraparound services that are important to all of our students, but extremely important for um, our single mothers. And, and one of the reasons that we're focusing on them is that the data shows that these women in particular, because they're getting behind, because they need these wraparound services, are dropping out. Um, so this is why we're focusing uh, so much on them. Okay, next. All right, so remember the difficulties balancing all responsibilities. I know um, I, that I am tired just balancing everything that I have to do. And thankfully, I was able to get out of that cycle of poverty. And so I'm exhausted at the end of the night. I have two grown sons and they, whew, they make me exhausted. But uh, if you are a woman who is working two jobs and at minimum wage, and even the mental health part of it will make you tired. And then you're trying to go to school. You're trying to help your children. Um, there, You can't afford childcare. You're worried about all of these things. You're trying to balance it. Um, it is extremely difficult. So remember that, have some empathy, uh, have some compassion. Uh, if they if they have, if you are building these positive relationships, some of these students will just come in your office just to vent. And that's okay. Uh, Jason and I have these students who do that all the time. <laughs> and and it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Okay, next. All right. Um, so make sure a student has air access to everything that they need to make her um, successful. And so um, that also means textbooks, um, anything like that. We have students who can't afford textbooks. We know that a lot of times textbooks for the semester can be more expensive than the actual tuition. And so, um, it's, we have to keep all of these things in mind. I think the other thing that uh, we're seeing more of as well is the mental health part of it. So we're focusing a little bit on that and I think that's going to be important as we go forward. All right. All right, next at the college level. Okay, the food pantry. This was something that was extremely important to me. And I did um, uh, with Jason's help and a couple of others. We started this on our South Campus, which is where Jason and I are. We, um, we started it there and we have food, but we also have clothing. Uh, we, and another thing that was important to me was that we have soap and we have stuff to wash our clothes with. We have, we have diapers, we have just all kinds of things that um, our single working mothers can use. But also we, the clothes, we have clothes for every age in the family, but we also have interviewing, um, interview clothes. So our mothers who come in and um, they can, um, if they're going on an interview, once they get, once they start to graduate, we have really nice clothes that our faculty and staff have donated and they can get these clothes. We give them to them. Uh, they can get these clothes, take them home and wear them to the interviews. It's uh, these students appreciate this so much, but it's so it's so much more than a food pantry. So this has been so successful that um, this has also been, um, uh, we've moved it to uh, main campus as well. And the food bank um, of, I wanna say Eastern North Carolina, I can't remember off the top of my head. So they're now on a, okay. So they're now on um, 
our main campus and they have given us freezer, refrigerator, shelving. So we now have uh, all of that kind of food, but they're closed over there. We have um, you know, toiletries, we have everything. So I'm really excited about that. The other thing I'm gonna throw in here, uh, I just don't wanna run out of time, but I'm excited because um, we have, um, I'm, we, I started a little bit of research. It came out of something else that happened. Uh, we are going to be, I don't know if any of the other colleges are doing this in North Carolina, but we are now going to provide all um, hygiene items in regard to women's periods uh, free for our students, because this is a poverty issue. Women cannot afford these items because they are so expensive. Um, and it, it is um, something that in the research that I found that they will not come to class if they are having their period and they cannot afford these items. And so we now, uh, we started on South Campus um, again, uh, Jason and I, we do, we start on South Campus with everything. And so, um, okay, so good. Um, so um, this is, you know, our president and vice president um, with ATD. ATD, we're, we're doing a lot of uh, products, um, a lot of things like this. So um, this is something that I'm extremely happy about. Um, just you, you'd be surprised how many things that our women living in poverty, working at, you know, earning minimum wage can't afford. So this has been extremely uh, exciting for us. Okay. All right. Child care. Oh my gosh. Okay. If you're living in poverty, you can't afford childcare for your children. So we, we have to figure out um, a way to provide childcare. Um, I know that we have a certain amount available for childcare, but it's not nearly enough uh, for our students. Um, I know that I had one student who was in class. I mean, I, I knew she was a single mother working um, and, and I was teaching a night class and she would frequently get up and not frequently two or three times during the class and get up and go outside to her car and I, I didn't know why and um, I, I finally found out it was because um, she had a middle school student in her car and um, that's what she had to do. She had to do what she had to do. And the middle school student was sitting in the car, doing her homework, listening to some music. But, and, and it was, you know, 5.30 to eight o'clock class, but she did not feel comfortable leaving her child at home. So her child was in the car doing homework, you know. But um, we have to figure out, you know, things there are why, you know, the why, there are different things that um, we could do something more with. Okay, next. Transportation, again, at the collegiate level, this is something that we can uh, help with more, provide transportation, we can do the gas cars. Um, also, um, this is something that we have to think about too. What if a person, you know, a single mother, and I, and I have seen this, what if a single mother does have a car and her car breaks down? What are we supposed to do? Um, is she going to be able to afford Lyft uh, or Uber to a car every time? And if you live um, in, an, in a rural area, the access to something like that is minimal. Um, so, you know, it's something that you have to think about. And so, um, in some cases, Advanced Grandma, what we have done is actually fixed the student's car. And so you have to think about, just think of outside the box for those kinds of things. Okay, next. <sighs> Provide access to internet service and textbooks. All right, internet service. 
Now, I have seen situations where students do not have access to internet. And so uh, this became very apparent, especially during the pandemic. And so students, a lot of times, are using their phones, and we found that out <laughs> during the pandemic. And you know, as well as I do, most of you, you cannot do uh, uh, and do it well, do your assignments very well, you, um, everything on your phone. And so we have to make sure that our students have everything they need uh, in regard to the internet, especially. Um, and so Advanced Granville, what we did during the pandemic, we had the drive up internet service at the campuses. Uh, there are just so many things that we have to do to help our students be successful. But for our working mothers, this can be especially more difficult um, when they need to find time. If they're working 80 hours a week, as this Oxfam study showed, and they're trying to figure out how, what things they're going to pay, the internet may be one of the last things they need to do, okay? So, um, and also, you know, one of the things that I have found, especially when we went online to the pandemic, if they are on their phones, then their phones actually may be cut off as well. So we have to be willing uh, with these to work with these mothers as they're trying to pay their bills. And so we also have to be able to provide uh, this kind of service. And the textbooks, we already know. Um, I have been very fortunate here at Vance Granville. If I have a, a, a student, um, who needs access to a textbook all I have to say is my student can't afford her textbook and and Jason will tell you the same thing this student cannot afford a textbook and that student gets a textbook so that's important okay okay this is one I think is extremely important for uh, working mothers so if they're in a program and they're trying to get a credential so that they can get out of poverty, but this credential uh, requires internships and they're having to work 80 hours a week, how are they going to do this internship? So we have to find um, programs that are willing to work with these mothers and provide them some type of internship that can be virtual. And so that's when we really have to work uh, and, and think outside the box. And um, so the college is going to have to, um, the college is going to have to be responsible for this because students, um, the students can't, you know, they don't know what they don't know. It, especially if you are um, a first generation college student, uh, like I was, my mother, you know, my mother didn't graduate from high school. And so, and if you're a single mother coming in and we're trying to tell you, you need a credential to get, to break out of this cycle, or you're the child of this mother, you need to get, break this cycle. But if you don't have that support at home for someone to tell you what to do, you don't know what to ask. And so we're having, we need to tell these students what to do. We need to help them through the process. So we, we need to be able to figure out what organizations can provide these virtual internships to help these mothers. Okay, now the state. The state has to help us. All right, so I, I saw in the new budget, this first one, so supposedly the internet access across the state is going to be improved. So this would be a wonderful thing if this comes to fruition. We shall see, because this is going to be important for everyone. K-12 students, this will be important for our students and this will be important for university students. Um, so this is in the new budget. 
uh, we, you know, I, I think this will be um, successful if this works. All right, especially for students, uh, you know, living in uh, rural areas. The state needs to prov uh, provide colleges with funds to assist with childcare. This is expensive. Colleges don't have the money to uh, provide this. And so we need to be able to do this. We need the money from the state. Okay. All right. So the state needs to provide colleges with career centers that working moms can use before and after graduation. So um, most universities have these kinds of options, but community colleges, some do, some don't, but we need something that focuses on working mothers. Um, to help them in particular so they can get out of poverty and that uh, subsequently their children can get out of it as well. All right. We need to provide financial support for programs that focus on this uh, demographic. So we know from the data that this group in particular is suffering. So there are a lot of programs that help other demographics uh, especially with it, within the community college system. I, I'm involved with a lot of those other groups and programs, and they're wonderful, and we see some um, progress, and, um, but there aren't a lot that support this particular demographic. And so I, I, this is one of the reasons that we at Vance Granwell, through uh, ATD, are going to focus uh, for the next three years on this particular group. So we need the state to help us financially with this as well. And finally, this is important. We need to ensure equal pay for all women. The state needs to make sure that we as women are being paid fairly and equitably. A lot, uh, you know, a woman should not be paid, you know, 80 cents on the dollar or 50 cents on the dollar when everything is equal. Uh, so the state has an obligation to make sure that we be are being paid fairly. So those, I think, are some of the main things that we can do at this point to make sure that uh, our working mothers who are earning minimum wage um, and that as a, you know, as a state, you know, we have a wonderful opportunity there. We live in an area that has a great, you know, we have a banking center. We have in Charlotte, we have all of these um, wonderful universities where uh, women could get jobs. We have um, the healthcare, you know, all over the state, UNC system, the Duke University system. Uh, we just, there's so many opportunities, but we have to prepare women. And so we have an opportunity as um, the community college system to do that. But we also need the support of the state as well. Okay, so here are our final thoughts. And th at this point, Jason and I would like to uh, take questions and see uh, what we can do to help you. And Jason is gonna, I think, been monitoring the chat because I haven't done that. Yes, and thank you for the wonderful session today. Uh, we do have one question from one of our participants. Are you able to see the Q&A? Um, can you see it, Jason? Oh, here it is. If not, I can read it to you. Okay. Okay, so are you or anyone in the session familiar with a community college in North Carolina that provides child care on campus? So um, the ones that, so we have the, the, the child care program. And so some of our students can apply to get their um, children into that program, but there are only a few slots for that. And so it, it's not, 
there aren't going to be enough slots to help enough mothers at all. I don't know of any other. Well, I'm sure there are other community colleges that do that. Yeah, okay. Anybody else? I believe someone uh, put in the chat, I believe Johnson and Forsyth have them. Okay. Yeah, not necessarily free. So, yeah, so they are subsidized. Um, and they have to go through... Um, it's social services that they have to go through. So it's not, it's not free. So they are getting subsidies for that. And they have to, so I have had a couple of students who use that and they have to maintain, if I remember correctly, certain GPAs and they can't, it, it's based on their financial aid too. Now don't quote me on that. Yeah, yeah. It's there, our wait list. And ours is at main campus. And it's, there aren't many students. And it also creates, like, because of the way our college is set up with the four campuses, if students are primarily on one of the satellite campuses, only having the facility at, at yeah. main makes it even more challenging. Mm -hmm. Not to, not to just jump in, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I also wanted to, the, and I apologize, I wasn't, my, I actually was not monitoring chat when I was sharing my screen, <laughs> but I am now. And I don't know, Frankie, if you had a chance to see that there were several responses of surprise that North Carolina was actually so low on the list. Um, and I, I, I think part of the reason why, and please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, is that North Carolina has this very strange topography where we have very, very, very wealthy places surrounded by extreme poverty. Um, our particular service area is like that. The Raleigh-Durham area where Frankie and I both live is very affluent, but we work at Vance Granville Community College, which services Vance County, Warren County, Granville County, uh, which struggle with poverty and the, the adverse effects of poverty. And so that's why North Carolina as a whole is problematic. I don't know if you saw in the chat area, uh, there was a question, um, but for you and I think for other community colleges, it says for schools to provide toiletries, diapers, et cetera, for their food pantries, do you have students apply to qualify or are they limited to a certain number of times they can receive items? I see this is because I grew up like this. I am not going to limit you to these things at all. So the one thing that we do um, require is that when you come in and um, you do, and this is for uh, more data purposes because the food bank is involved, is that you do have to fill out um, a form so that they can just keep up with the data. Uh, that has your name and, and it says you're not going to go out and sell the stuff that we give you. But we do not limit. I'm not going to tell you that you can't come in and get diapers for your child or you can't come in and get soap or things like that. Uh, that, that is extremely important to me. Um, so we, we don't limit it. And I know here at Rowan Cabarrus Community Colleges, our, ours is unlimited. Uh, Kimberly Lackey, I'm not sure what school she's from. Uh, she said her food and hygiene clauses are open to everyone, no questions asked. AB Tech doesn't have an application process and it's unlimited. Anytime the college is open, they can get food and student services. The other thing too is that um, faculty and staff, we, we have found that we have faculty and staff who are in this situation as well. So ours is open to faculty and staff also. Oh, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? And we have a little bit of time. So uh, we can certainly, while we have this platform, um, you know, we can open up questions for this session or if there's anything you've thought of while we've been um, uh, listening to this wonderful uh, presentation today, we're, you know, we can address those as well.
any well i i could talk about this all day i just <laughs> this is something that's extremely important to me because of the way that i grew up and I, and i encourage you <laughs> when you have um when you have students like this in your classroom um try to be compassionate it may not be easy to put yourself in in that situation if you have not grown up like that um, but um, you'd be surprised how just a kind word will make a difference. And Jason and I, um, we, we teach a, a little lesson together um, in English 111, and there are a lot of stereotypes um, based on homelessness, and even as adults, we can um we can be we can be kind of cruel to each other based on those stereotypes and so i encourage you to stay away from those stereotypes and not um force those stereotypes on your students and you know i i, I am one of those you know a product like i said of a mother and when i came to college i went to nc state as a first generation student not having any clue whatsoever what I was supposed to do. And I went there with, and I quit in the middle of my second semester because I didn't know what I was supposed to do. And I didn't have anybody who had any compassion to help me. And I didn't know how to figure it out. And I worked in restaurants like my mother did for uh, another year. And then I said, Frankie, this is not what you're going to do. You're going to break the cycle and you're going to get out and you'll figure it out. So I went back to state and I figured it out by myself because no, uh, no adults had any compassion for me. So I'm incur encouraging you to have compassion because your students who are in this situation do not know what to ask you. So anybody else? Mm. All right, we have a, a couple questions in the Q and A. If you'd like to take a look at those. Okay. So okay. So Jason, you can look at these two and tell me uh, and help me as well. Would you like for me to read them to you? I, I can see them. I pulled them up. Okay. So how you support technology skills. Okay. So the technology part can, this one can be diff, difficult because if you, if you are extremely poor, you may not have had access to a lot of technology. So they're coming in and, and we're finding that, um, yeah, they're, you know, Jason and I talk about this and, and I've talked about this with other, other instructors. And like in something like English 111, not only are we teaching English, we're teaching them basic skills <laughs> about how to do, you know, an email how to do a PowerPoint, how to do anything. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is extra work that we're having to do, but you're having, I mean, you have to understand that you have to take the student where that student is coming from and not see it as a burden. Um, if you see it as a burden, I'm, I'm just going to, be right up front with you. If, if it's a burden to you, you're in the wrong place. Um, it, and I don't know how else to say that. I would, I would also add in that a lot of um, dealing with learning to use an LMS and, and what they have access to at home, a lot of that comes into the advising and actually knowing one's students because it, it, our 
advising was restructured in the past um, several years uh, to try to deal with that type of problem where people were being put into online classes who had never mm. used a computer. Uh, and that's a problem. And it goes back in many ways to that first thing that we were talking about as far as building relationships, because many of, especially our first generation students are unwilling to say, I have no idea how to do this. I've never been on a computer. And they just sort of flow along for a while and then disappear. And if we can get, develop that relationship early with someone at the college, which ideally it's an instructor, but it can be an advisor. It can be someone who works in the office, uh, especially for those students who are first coming in and are working mothers who are dealing with issues that if you've got like an early college program, those early college kids just don't even have any idea of yet. So that that person has someone with whom they can speak and be supported. We're much more likely to be able to catch those types of problems and, and assist them. So Jennifer, I think question really the the instructor we don't really have anything. It, the instructor has to be compassionate, and I keep saying that over and over. But the the instructor has to be compassionate, willing to take the time. So those are good questions. I really appreciate when. Uh, coming and listening to us today and supporting us. And I hope that you will take back uh, the story that I shared because you are teaching people like my mother and me. So, all right. If okay. you have any further questions, you can reach out to me at Vance Granville. Thank you very much. We appreciate you uh, uh, providing this wonderful presentation for us today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our session today, the DEI Journey of the Rotary Club of Salisbury. Before we begin, I wanted to cover some housekeeping items. Please leave your cameras and microphones muted throughout the session. We have the chat feature for communication. However, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature. We will get to as many of them as we can at the end of the session. And now, please allow me to introduce Mr. Ted W. Goings, Jr. Mr. Goings began his career in health and human services as a nursing assistant. A graduate of Lenoir Ryan University, Go Mr. Goings is a licensed nursing home administrator and served at Trinity Village in that capacity for 10 years prior to being named president and CEO in 2000. Mr. Goings has served as board chair for Lutheran Services in America, has served on the North Carolina Legislative Study Commission on Aging, on the North Carolina State Board of Examiners for Nursing Home Administrators, on the Board of Leading Age. He is currently on the Board of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service, Vice Chair of the Board of the North Carolina Health Facilities Association, and President of the Rotary Club of Salisbury. Please welcome Mr. Ted W. Goings, Jr. All right, thank you very much. Um, can, you, can you hear me okay, Stephen? Or... Yes, I can. Yep, very good. Just making sure that we've got everything covered here. And thank you for allowing us to be here. And it's my pleasure uh, to present the stars of this show. Uh, and many of you know uh, Dr. Carol Spalding. Uh, Dr. Spalding uh, has been president of Rowan Cabarrus Community College since 2008. Uh, and, and it's just amazing to me that uh, RCCC serves over 20,000 students annually at seven major locations across uh, Cabarrus and Rowan counties. Uh, under her leadership, uh, uh, RCCC has just continued to grow uh, and, and serve in this community in so many different ways, including uh, having uh, uh, Building 400 being the first uh, LEED Gold Certified facility uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, and, and so we're just real proud of everything that, uh, that uh, you all have done over at the community college and especially you, Dr. Spaulding. Uh, Dr. Spalding pre uh, previously served on the board of directors of the American Association of Community Colleges, uh, the Rowan County Economic Development Commission, Cabarrus Chambers of Commerce, and was the 2019 president of the year of the North Carolina Community College Association. And then uh, Dr. Virgil Lattimore uh, is president uh, and uh, professor of pastoral psychology at Hood Theological Seminary here in Salisbury, uh, a native of Charlotte. Um, 
He served previously at uh, Methodist Theological School in Ohio. He's an elder in the uh, uh, African-American Episcopal Zion Church uh, in the uh, Air National Guard, served as the assistant to the chief of chaplains of the U.S. Air Force, uh, and was the first African-American chaplain to attain the rank of brig brigadier general uh, in the U.S. Air Force and the Air National Guard. So it's just an honor for me to uh, present them to you uh, and, uh, and to share a little bit about the story of the uh, Salisbury Rotary Club. So just a few um, opening remarks, and if you will, we can um, forward the slides. I think someone told me that they, and you can go ahead to the next slide. Uh, there we go. And, uh, and we chose to present our program today as movements of music to change the tune of the organization, in this case, our Rotary Club, uh, as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we, um, we created those movements, uh, just like you would in music, with history, uh, then study, then the plan, and then the implementation. Uh, and next slide, please. Just a, a little bit of history. Um, Rowan, uh, or the uh, Rotary Club, was founded in, in Chicago in 1905 now has 1.4 million members in 46,000 clubs all over the world. And that built in diversity at the international level, obviously. Uh, Rowan uh, uh, Rowan's uh, Rotary and uh, Rotary International focus on world peace, fighting disease, uh, diversity, equity and inclusion, environment, local concerns. Uh, just 15 years after founding uh, uh, Rotary International, Little Old Salisbury became one of the first Rotary Clubs in the state, and we were founded in 1920. Uh, Rotary was primarily a club for civic leaders, and in Salisbury and much of the United States, that meant uh, white and men. Uh, women were first invited to membership 32 years ago, and now the club is 23% female. The first African-American uh, was actually the president of uh, Livingstone College uh, at the time, uh, was invited to join 30 years ago. So we've made some slow progress, but not near enough, and especially not in light of Rotary International and societal changes in our country, and because of, of, of even local uh, change and the, and the desire and the need for change. In 2019, our then president, Steve Fisher, uh, who's the president of uh, f and Bank here, led our club in addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion, calling for a DEI initiative and a committee to help make the changes that we felt like we needed. A diverse committee uh, was formed, meeting every other week for four months. They were very active. Um, uh, it, was, it was a committee of folks that volunteered uh, to serve, uh, either were asked to, and I know uh, Dr. Spalding, uh, immediately asked to be a part of this uh, because of her commitment to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And their challenge was to diversify and expand Rotary membership in the Rotary Club of Salisbury and do it with intentionality. And so with that, let's change the slide to movement two, and I believe that will take us to Dr. Spalding. All right. Uh, thank you, Ted. Um, glad to see Virgil here and thank all of you for, for joining us. It's unusual probably for a Rotary to be included in something like the guide conference, but the Rotary Club promoted the first guide conference and got a lot of really good uh, outcomes from it. And so uh, I want to just tip my hat to, to President uh, Ted for um, also putting this one forward as a contribution to the cause of on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the community. Uh, so yes, I did volunteer for this study because uh, to do this work uh, with Virgil in particular, because this is an area that is a great concern to all of us and nobody knows everything. So I really felt like this would be a great learning opportunity for me and we would learn together. That certainly was true. Uh, so we started this study and it was every other week um, for a, you know, an intensive period of time. It was probably the, the most rewarding and meaningful volunteer work I think I've ever done because the group that we worked with of 10 
every black member of the uh, Rotary Club was in this committee along with two presidents, uh, our, the committee chairs and a few others that were really interested and they had really good attendance. So people were really committed to this. Um, they knew they were on uh, difficult territory because not everybody wants to change, especially an old club with older people. Um, and so I think we didn't assume anything. Uh, so we did meet and talk, and I think those kinds of things were lear as much learning as anything else. Our task was to put together, put together a survey. You'd think that'd be pretty easy. It was not. Um, so even figuring out how to word the questions was something that we, we dealt with. Um, I think for a while we were um, very careful about everybody's feelings and pushing too fast or too hard. Um, fortunately, we had a former uh, uh, chairman uh, who was also worked in a bank that did this, that was ahead of us in terms of doing their own survey and doing their own work. So that helped guide us along as well as everybody else's experience. So those things were, were very, very helpful. Um, so I would recommend to anybody to get on a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee because those conversations are transformational. And hopefully they are, and I think they were for the Rotary Club in general. So the, the, uh, after we did the, um, the survey, uh, we'll have a little bit of uh, some of the detail here. Um, only 29 people filled out the survey. The club is about 103 in membership. Um, but during this time is when COVID hit. And so we, this committee operated during pre-COVID times plus COVID times. And so we were doing things on uh, Zoom. Our, our membership was not that comfortable with all of it. Um, we did have options to mail it out and all of it. So um, we had two questions in there besides the demographics that I, I wanted to surface to this group because I felt like they were very pivotal during the time that we were putting this survey together. And it, it felt like at the time an act of courage to even put them forward strangely enough, but um, what we wanted to do is to know how people are interpreting some of the, of the big things that were happening um, in, the, in the previous year. So uh, the discussion about Black Lives Matter was not something that Rotary usually talks about, but we did here. And uh, so we, we asked people what they thought it meant, not that there was any right answer for the club at all, but we wanted to get the range of people's thinking here. Um, and then on, a lot of people, four people out of 29, gave us specific things about what that meant to them. Um, so that should give you some idea, but the, the real battle was, do we ask the question? And uh, I think at some point, you know, we, we decided we would do it, we would report it out. So that's the first one. The second one, which is the second one I'm gonna share with you, um, which is the events at the Capitol in Washington on December 6, 2021, what did you see? And so here, eight people um, didn't, didn't like our choices. They put all kinds of other choices in there to help us understand how people are seeing this event and what did that mean? Um, so we were looking at all kinds of um, social and civil unrest uh, during the survey and we wanted to capture it to see how our membership was uh, feeling about it. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so we also wanted to see if there was support for a long-term diversity goal. Um, and you can see here that before we did anything, um, yes, uh, the Rotary Club has been reflective of its community, at least in its own mind, of white male business leaders for over hundred years. And so it was not that hard a shift to say, okay, we want to shift our uh, membership to reflect the new reality and the new business leaders of the community. So here you see a really good support for the long-term diversity goal um, of 25 to four people saying no. Do you go to the next one? Okay, and I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Dr. Virgil Latimer, who's going to talk to us about um, diversity and equity and inclusion as it's interpreted through the Rotary four-way test. Thank you, President Goins and uh, uh, President Spalding. Uh, it, it was a, uh, as, as, as both have said, a very fulfilling experience being a part of, of this DEI committee of Rotary uh, 
and, and, and a number of things uh, surfaced, uh, both in terms of the relationships uh, that, that we had to be uh, you know, in a secure space so that persons would feel comfortable sharing their views and their thoughts and their, uh, some of their uh, uh, feelings related to some of these very sensitive issues. But we thought it was not only timely, but that it was uh, very productive and very positive in terms of the vision of Rotary, uh, Rotary's historical uh, vision of itself as an organization in the world that, that fosters change. And, and one of the things as we were, uh, as we were uh, trans interpreting the results of the survey and uh, feedback from, board, uh, from members of the, uh, of the club, uh, the, the idea surfaced, should we create our own statement concerning uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion? And, and one of my positions on this is that, well, Rotary already has what I think is a very uh, time-tested four-way test, which I think embraces the vision of sort of viewing people, uh, of valuing people, of of, of, of looking at issues in, in the society, which foster uh, both issues of justice and, and, and parity. And, and those are, are embedded in the four-way test. And, uh, and I just wanna share those, uh, those questions. They're actually questions which kind of prod persons of goodwill to examine themselves and, and examine their values and visions for a world where, where people are valued for who they are and, and for what they can contribute. So the first question there is, is it the truth? So uh, in, in, in being a person in a theological setting, we often uh, say that part of what happens in both faith and in, uh, uh, in organizations which uh, embed values is truth telling, that is telling the truth. And then that second question, is it fair to all concerned? So this gets into the issue of equity and justice. Is it fair uh, in terms of how resources and how opportunity is distributed? Is it fair to all concerned? Uh, number three, will it build goodwill and better relationships? And I think that is something that I think every organization should examine. But I think Rotary uh, asked that question and um, um, and, and asked, again, the issue of, of, of how we are uh, helping society be a better place for everybody. And then finally, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Again, um, we know that in society there are, there, there are inequities, but the issue is uh, what are we doing to, um, to have whatever action it is to be beneficial uh, to, to others. So I think the, the, the four-way test is a, 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 a parallel process to good, uh, sound, diversity, equity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, so we offer that to you as a way to, to, to examine uh, what you do in your organization. So uh, with that, we can go on to movement, uh, movement three. Uh, I mean, this, this, that's movement three, movement four. Yeah. Oh, a, also a part of movement three is uh, during that this process of sharing and we did some small group breakouts, one of the things that, that occurred as we were sort of tabulating the results is that a story surfaced from one of the longtime members. And it was a story of what I would consider, uh, we could consider it an injustice or an oversight or a, mis a, a gross misunderstanding, which led to uh, a person of color being denied membership. Okay. And part of what occurred there is that um, there was some conversation, we call it sidebar conversations to a way of reckoning or a way of bringing that into focus. And, um, um, and, 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 and President Ted and others had conversations which led to uh, what I call a, an intergenerational bridge and I'll let uh, Dr. Uh, I'll, I'll let President Ted talk about what occurred as a result of this story being told uh, to uh, to the committee, and later uh, an action being taken, which I consider very corrective and very justice making. 
So President Ted. Okay, I will uh, just share briefly that uh, uh, O.K. Beatty was a, a much um, loved um, uh, uh, professor at Livingstone College. Uh, he was the first um, black member of the city council, I believe, and was the first black mayor pro tem of the of the uh, city council. And and so it was really a shock when uh, you know when uh, when we learned about this. Uh, but again, that was a, a kind of a different era, and and uh, uh, and he was denied that membership. And when we were recounting this, thanks to the work, I mean, this shows you the value of just the DEI work. When this came up to the committee and the club, immediately one of the members said, "Could we do a posthumous membership for Dr. Beatty?" And and immediately, I mean, there was just a gasp. I mean, I gasped. Uh, uh, just at the thought of, of what that meant to me and what that could mean to our club. So we reached out to his son, Brian, who is uh, pictured on the screen with a couple of the leaders of our club. Uh, uh, Brian, uh, who graduated from um, uh, Boyden, now Salisbury High School, uh, lives in, um, in, uh, in Raleigh. And we invited him to come and join us for this event. And, um, and he graciously... Uh, uh, accepted that. And, you know, again, that could have gone either way. He could have said, you know, you didn't treat my dad right and no thank you. But he graciously agreed to come. He talked eloquently about his father. And at that meeting, we presented a posthumous um, membership in our Rotary Club to uh, O.K. Beatty uh, and, um, uh, and also uh, a Paul Harris Fellowship, uh, one of our highest awards uh, in the club uh, that comes with a, a contribution to the work of, of Rotary International. Uh, and, uh, and Brian told great stories about his dad, and it was just a, a wonderful event. And it doesn't fix what we did uh, all those years ago, but it does uh, help to help in some way to right a wrong. Uh, Virgil, back to you. Well, thank you, uh, President Ted. Um, and um, Following, uh, not only, again, was that a, a gracious event, a number of persons from the community came uh, to, uh, to witness that, uh, that action. And part of what has also led, uh, the, the, uh, and, and it's, it's part of the new administration of Rotary, of Salisbury Rotary, to have diversity moments uh, at, at, at the meetings where a, any member can share something that relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And those moments have been, and, and it, you know, these are moments at the beginning of the meeting, which are part of the weekly agenda, which, which keeps the issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion as, as I would say, it, 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 uh, it, 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 it internalizes, uh, institutionalizes what I think is an important uh, initiative uh, as part and make it part of the norm of operation so that we can stay alert for how our organization is serving uh, uh, and reaching beyond its own uh, comfort zones to uh, include others that uh, it has not done so in the past. So I think that is that is very important. Uh, and I think, uh, and, and uh, uh, President Ted can, can talk about this, that has led, it's fascinating that uh, more recently we've had seven or eight new members to join. And of that group, uh, five have been persons of color, I believe, uh, and, and women. So at any rate, it, 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 it says, it, it, it makes a great difference when an organization changes its tune to um, appeal to others that it has not pa had, had done so in the past. And I think that's an important uh, uh, social action. Very good. If we can move, uh, if we can move to the next slide. It's not done. I think that's it. Okay. Oh, okay. These are members of the committee. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I just I think... wanted to to lift up the all the people that served. And of course, Dr. Spalding and. And Dr. Lattimore uh, and Elaine Spalding, I didn't mention who is the president of the Chamber of Commerce, was the uh, president of the club after Steve Fisher. And she carried this 
Mm -hmm. uh, work right on um, uh, and never missed a beat. And I have tried to do the same uh, as I have taken over from Elaine. Right. Uh, any anything else y'all want to say about the committee? Uh, I will. Um, that you know this this actually represented all the minority members uh, of the club at the time, and um, it was. Pro this is the transformational group that I think uh, really made a difference in our progress. Everyone was very considerate of each other's feelings. So you know. As the as one of the chairs, I was pushing for let's get the survey finished. Let's get the <laughs> survey finished. And yet there were there was unfinished business in the group about should this question be in there? Do we want to ask it? What are we going to do with it? Um, and will this make the members, the longtime members, uncomfortable? And this is something that that the new members, the minority members, were really attuned to more so than I was. Um, and so we were very considerate of each other's feelings. And uh, I think that was true when you, when you talked about the OK Beatty um, uh, experience too. Mm -hmm. So the committee worked with the board, uh, which is an elected board from a club, just as you can imagine. And the, the board was uh, as dedicated to this and making us successful and carrying the banner of equity and diversity and inclusion as much as anyone. Um, and so th there was much uh, support um, in the newsletter and on and on and on. So it was a concerted effort over now the third term, if not more with uh, Ted, you're being president now. Um, so I think that that has been a great learning experience. And so it was incredibly rewarding to see that new membership list come up from the last year of 10 um, very high level people um, and having those be half uh, people of color. And so, you know, it wasn't just because you're a person of color, but fortunately for Roland County is we have minority people of color taking responsibility in really key jobs superintendent of schools, for example, um, which uh, was filled by uh, Dr. Tony Watlington here. Um, and he is a person of color and uh, now a good friend. So it's, it, I think what people felt really good about is that we were not compromising anything um, to bring in these very worthy members. It just took us, um, a little more assertiveness and getting out of our own way to help bring those people forward. Um, so I just sort of open that as a discussion point for, for this group, um, Virgil and Ted, uh, just on your observations of that result, which frankly, the survey and all this work has been done, this is within uh, the same year. So I'm very pleased with the progress that this group has made um, in, real, in a real way. Uh, and that membership thing being key to Rotary. So, Ted or Virgil, you have anything? Um, I, I would I would just throw in, um, um, you know, I heard uh, I, I serve on one of our Lutheran Church, uh, an African descent strategy team. So, a strategy to, as you can imagine, our Lutheran Church is uh, uh, comes out of that German. Uh, European Lutheran tradition and, and is heavily white and and this group is uh, is charged with doing the same thing kind of in the church setting and and it's one of the few places that I that I work where I am the minority um, I'm one of the few people uh, that are, are not of color that are on this uh, that are on this committee and in a discussion a couple of years ago one of um, one of the we were talking about privilege and one of the um, one of the members of the committee said, if we, and this was a, an African-American person said, if we could fix privilege, we would have done it a long time ago. That it's, it's you, it's the people that have the privilege that have, to, that have to make that change. And that really hit me between the eyes because it, it's the people that had the power and have the power and the privilege, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that, that are in large part uh, charged and, and have to work to change that. I'm reminded in Rotary, and it's in every one of our worlds, I think this is the same, but it, in our rotary hut where we meet, we have this huge wall and it's all uh, white men 
from uh, we're, our club's 102 years old. So uh, our, our, our club has uh, uh, a, a solid wall of old white men that have led that club. Um, but uh, it, it gives me hope that we are working so hard to, to change that. Uh, we have had uh, 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 women uh, now to be uh, 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 presidents of the club, a number actually in the last few years. Uh, and, uh, and it's our hope that uh, I, I'd love to be the last white president of the club, but, uh, but it, when it's, when it's right, uh, uh, we'll, we'll do that too. And, and I think we're, we're certainly ready and past ready for that, uh, uh, to happen. It just hasn't, uh, uh, it, it just hasn't happened yet. Um, uh, but I really do think that, uh, that, that we're on the right path. Virgil, you may have some things to add to all that. No, I, I think, I think you've, you've, you've really, uh, uh, identified an important hope and vision for the club. I think that um, one of the things that, I mean, it's it, to be a part of a community with, with, with four educational institutions and, a, and uh, uh, I think uh, that, that that holds out hope because these institutions are training not only future leaders uh, for, our, for our society, but uh, uh, but I know here at 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 Hood Theological Seminary we pride ourselves in training spiritual leaders who can have impact on the community. So I think one of the one of the ideas that came up in the in the in the recommendations as well is that the Rotary would reach out to the the student leaders at the colleges and the and even the schools to also begin to share with them our. Uh, all the wonderful things that Rotary has done with, with, with projects in the community of you know, not only of, of helping vaccinations, uh, eliminating, uh, addressing health issues around the world, but looking at needs in the community and that connecting with young leaders is a way for Rotary to expand its wonderful vision as an international organization. So I, I think it's, uh, I'm hopeful I'm hopeful uh, that that can, in fact, take place. So I would add, um, and there are two questions here that we'll pull out. There's a question about Kannapolis, and there's a question about when the Rotary Club uh, began to re respond to diversity and inclusion. Um, so we've had minority members for, certainly in your role, your predecessor, Virgil. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Amer. Dr. Amer, who just passed in Texas. Um, who was, you know, a real important member of the Rotary Club, um, but we didn't have many more. Um, and yeah. so, you know, that was a positional, uh, you know, acknowledgement when you think about it. Um, and so I think the Rotary has been good at that part of, of bringing people in if they were, if they were the chamber president or if they were the you know, the president of f &M Bank or whatever it happened to be. Um, this needs a little more creativity out there um, and more contacts with people. So um, out of that group of five that came in, we had the superintendent, we had an attorney, and I've forgotten some of the other credentials that were there. But mm -hmm. they're, you know, they fit the club uh, standards, frankly. Um, so let me just pause for a minute on the Rotary piece, which you heard a lot about from Ted. But in North Carolina, Rotary Clubs are a very big deal. That's not always true. And in rural communities, they're a very big deal too, which is where the, the community leaders come together. They learn, they have professional development every week. Uh, they do good works for others. They contribute money. Uh, they build parks. Uh, you know, you can look at all kinds of evidence. If you go to Kannapolis, you'll see the Rotary train is there. If you go to Concord, you're gonna see the park is there. Um, and then we've got a, I think, a real commitment to the, a couple of parks plus a monument to uh, the veterans. So there's quite a bit, that plus uh, raising money for scholarships. And in our case, um, the, the same group of uh, colleges and university colleges that are here are all getting scholarship money out of Rotary. And this last year, uh, that commitment was expanded um, we would normally give, we meaning the Rotary Club of Salisbury, would normally give money to um, Rowan Cabarrus Community College uh, future attendees, one per high school, and now it's two per high school. 
And so I think those kinds of commitments have grown. Um, and so these are, these are really vital um, organizations, but they were not really tuned into the need to bring people in to the extent that we needed to. So I say we're a little late to the game, but, you know, with the death of George Floyd, I think everybody's uh, uh, attention uh, was heightened. Uh, with COVID, we had time to think about things. Um, and so I think it was probably right time, right place, and right readiness um, during this period of time on moving that forward. Um, but I think, Ted, you've got a different position from the board and, and Virgil on that. Um, but I was, I really wanted to be the vice chair, as you said, because I felt like the community college has diversity baked in. Um, and yet we don't, you know, we don't pay as much attention to it as we should. And so, and we also don't lead out exterior, you know, in this kind of a forum um, where it might make a difference. So I wanted to contribute a lot there and learn something as well. I did want to throw in there too, um, the, one of our projects that I'm, uh, that I, we've done for a number of years now that I'm just so thrilled with is called Happy Feet. Uh, and again, to Virgil's point about how we serve in the community and the scholarships is one of the largest things that we do. And, mm -hmm. and those scholarships go to the local institution. So we're trying to keep our children and our money uh, local, uh, mm -hmm. obviously, for, for, for the right reasons. But, but many of you have heard the statistics about what children, you know, that, that, that children get to the third grade. And, you know, if, if, if they don't have certain skills at that level, uh, that, uh, that, that they're going to get behind and never catch back up. And, and the Rotary Club wanted to find a way to, to help locally. And so we started a program called Happy Feet. And we provide a, uh, and I just love the program, we, we provide a, a pair of shoes for every child going into the third grade. Um, and, and, uh, and they get to pick those shoes out. We do it with a local uh, uh, shoe uh uh, company here in town, and and the uh, the parents or the school brings the children, and then uh, a Rotarian accompanies them. Their parents are not allowed to go in, <laughs> so that the kids can get the shoes they want, not mm -hmm. the shoes the parents would pick out for them. Uh, and we all know what know how that works. But to see the the smiles on those faces as as they come out that door is so rewarding. And to be able to do it for the entire school system. Now this year we were not able to do it, and uh, because of COVID, uh, and and it just broke our hearts that we had oh. to put that off uh, till next year. But frankly, with the supply chain issue, apparently all those little third grader tennis shoes are sitting on ships off the coast of California mm -hmm. uh, and other places. And the school system was having some issues, obviously with with COVID and trying to get things done. So we had to put that off for this year, but we raised the money for that. And then, and then we have a, a club member that has contributed to that process also to make sure that we could expand it to the entire school system. So we are um, uh, sorry, we can't do it this year, but thrilled to be able to do it next year. But even at that, I just found this out this week that um, the school system reached out to us about four children uh, that actually needed a pair of shoes um, that, that were in that bad of shape that needed a pair of shoes. And we were able to, at least on that small level, keep happy feet going even this year. And we're able to provide sho shoes for those four students uh, for, the, for the year. So I, I, I'm, I'm thrilled at least we were able to do that much uh, for, the, for the children. Right. I want to an answer the second question that was up there is, does the Kannapolis Rotary have a diversity equity and inclusion committee. I do not think so. My husband is in that club and I think I would know if they had one. Um, and I think it is a good exercise for everyone. I mean, as much as we like to share things among each other, uh, sometimes the struggle of putting your own survey together is worth it. Um, so we can, we can model good behavior here, uh, but I think it's everybody's journey to, to go through and figure out uh, how to do the recruitment and how to do the, the changes that are necessary to, to change the culture of, of the local Rotary Club. So um, I will put a bug in his ear about that. And uh, we know actually tonight is um, the international president of the 
the world, the international world president of Rotary is uh, having, having a celebration gala um, in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my husband and I are going to that. Um, and there'll be a lot of, a lot of inter interesting information about what the priorities are. And uh, diversity has never really been one because we've been diverse from the get-go, as Dr. Latimer mentioned, um, when you have Africa and South America and the entire globe uh, as members and with clubs and activities, you, you, def you have it. Um, but we don't have it within our, um, within, our, within our neighborhoods to the extent that we re really want that. Um, so uh, I'm just contribute that. I, I do want to spend a little more time uh, on the Rotary four-way test because we just, you know, you know how you do the Pledge of Allegiance and you do the Rotary four, and, and it's just not meaningful as much. Um, but what happened during our conversation as we thought about creating our own diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, statement a lot of work, a lot of, you know, wordsmithing um, to have Dr. Lattimore reinterpret that for the group uh, got instantaneous uh, support. Um, so, you know, if you could just spend a little more time on that, uh, I thought, I don't know if you had an inspiration in the meeting or if you've been thinking about it for half your life. I'm not sure where that came from, but <laughs> Um, it really made, I think, Rotary more relevant and less strange. We, don't, we are not doing anything odd. We are looking at that statement and making it work for everyone. Yeah. Well, I think the issue of, I mean, for me, I mean, an organization that has fought disease around the world, eradicated uh, some diseases, uh, helped people get clean drinking water in places, uh, that have been underdeveloped, uh, but then to come to local, I mean, to have that kind of broad vision around the world, but it, 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 it doesn't, I don't think it took much for me to read, to translate that, to say if goodwill and health and wholeness of people and communities is something that an organization does globally, then locally, there should be some evidence of where that is taking place in, in local communities, where there is poverty, where there is uh, not, uh, you know, uh, disparities in education and health, then, then I think uh, that to me makes sense to say the organization has a, a, a vision. It's sort of like, you know, a constitution of the United States uh, at times when it, it has not always been translated uh, or, or act made real in the lives of persons, but it has a framework which can make those uh, those kind of actions real. Which to me uh, says to when it spoke to me, uh, the, the four way test said to me at the local Rotary, we don't have to invent, invent the wheel. We just need to walk the talk that our organization has been founded on. So. That, that's, I don't know if it was inspiration or it was just a matter of trying to connect uh, some important pieces. It's sort of like a puzzle, seeing some pieces of a puzzle come together. So Ted, do you wanna to add to that? Um, uh, you know, I, I've always been one, I, I like to have, um, you know, when you start parsing pieces out into different, in, into different things, so you have a, you, you, you have a separate diversity piece and you have a separate yeah. piece about this and that, yeah. you know, sometimes those things get lost. Um, they, they, they sound good to start with, but is it sustainable? So I've always liked to keep the things in the big buckets mm -hmm. and there's no bigger, more inclusive bucket to me than our four-way test. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so to, to really um, plan to, you know, and, and work hard to incorporate our DEI work right it baked into what we already do. Mm -hmm. just made a lot of sense to me. Yeah, yeah. Right. And in the political issues that we've been experiencing, I don't know that we're at the end of it either, um, to do a survey and to have these conversations, uh, you know, was more risky than if we'd done it five years ago, frankly. 
Mm -hmm. um, and yet I think we've uh, sustained it. I don't think anybody's walked off in a huff or made a declaration I'm quitting because this is no bad behavior at all. Um, and I think that that speaks uh, well to this group. And I think by reinterpreting, um, shining a light on the four-way test, people um, understood that we just weren't seeing it broadly enough yeah. and that this will work for us going forward. So I want to, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say tone, the tone and tenor of that with the results of the of the survey and the way in which we uh, we attempted to foster conversation, I think the tone and the tenor tenor were right, and and so I think we struck the right chord as we as we move forward, keeping in touch with our theme of changing the tune of the organization. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. So I, I want to go back, and, and since we have a little time, I want to go back to the OK Baby story. Mm. Um, um, I traveled to Australia, and one of the things that was very dominant there was an apology at every big civic thing we went to, a symphony concert, for example, or a lecture or whatever, started with an acknowledgement of the indigenous people Mm -hmm. and an apology for the treatment that they had experienced on, I don't know if this was voluntary or not voluntary, or it was expected, but that that was really, uh, this was maybe three or four years ago, but it was really dominant. Uh, it was striking. And, you know, we haven't done much apologizing and we've talked about reparations and all kinds of stuff. So the OK Beatty, Experience, which the board initiated as a result of some really good conversation, but not the committee specifically, um, was a chance to really cause a problem where people don't feel like they need to apologize or, you know, that's another whole thing, right? Um, and yet, uh, this couldn't have been more gracious. And I think you use that term, uh, Ted, that's exactly how it felt, is that the sun um, and Livingstone uh, brought, I think, maybe eight people to witness this thing um, and to uh, interact with the Rotary Club and feel that apology, feel that we have done something about this. We haven't just said, oh, yeah, that was a bad idea. We weren't there. We don't have to do anything. But we also didn't overdo it. Um, you know, we didn't make the, our predecessors look bad or accuse them. I mean, it was so well handled. I, I just really uh, think that that was uh, quite spectacular. And just want to congratulate you, Ted, on uh, doing that, or your the board at least on pulling that together. And then you know, just knowing that Rowan County's people um, could handle that experience. Um, you're not sure what they people can handle when you've got a monument issue and other kinds of things, which we did not ask about. Um, but I, I do think we, you know, we tried to move the needle as best we could. And I thought that was just a really great example. Well, and, and you know, when, um, when Dr. Beatty, when, when, our, when our member had to go back to Dr. Beatty and tell him that he was, you know, because we'd already, you know, said we'd like to put your name up for membership, then they had to go back to him and say, it's not going to happen. And, and how embarrassing that was for this member that had, that had uh, uh, nominated him. But when he said this, Dr. Beatty told a story that I think is worth telling. And, and it reminds me so much of Nelson Mandela and the way he, he, you know, he could have been a very angry and vindictive and vicious person, but instead he, he chose a much more biblical and, and conciliatory path. And Dr. Beatty said the same thing. He said, well, it reminded him of when he was in the army and, you know, he, he served in the Philippines uh, and, and, uh, and, and served our country. But when the train full of, um, of black troops were coming in one direction, uh, I think this was down in the deep south, and they stopped at a uh, they stopped at a at a depot, and the the black soldiers were now not allowed to go in to eat. Now, Dr. Beatty told this story in response to being told he couldn't join Rotary. Um, uh, said that, that the black soldiers were told they could not go in in the depot to eat they'd have to eat outside because they're black. And, 
At the same time, a train full of German prisoners was coming through in the other direction to a prisoner of war camp. And the German prisoners were allowed to go in and eat. And, you know, Dr. Beatty's um, view of that was it's just the way it is. You know, it doesn't mean it's right, but it's just the way it is. And Dr. Beatty, uh, um, um, he, he accepted, graciously accepted the fact that he was not going to be joining the club for that kind of that same reason. So I, I think if we all give each other a little bit of grace, um, you know, we'll, we'll get a lot further in this world. And, and I, I don't think I'll ever forget that story because of the way Dr. Beatty uh, reacted. Mm. Well, that's, that's more grace than we're going to see in, in 2021, I believe. Um, <clears throat> and hopefully we won't see that kind of experience again that I think our awareness has been heightened and uh, the four-way test will tell us, is it fair to all concern? And the answer will be no. Right. You know, I think this will be a great criteria. Yeah. Uh, so we're probably ready just to have some final comments here. I don't know if there are any other questions that need to be answered. We've got them uh, going through here. Uh, and I think um, some great, lovely chat is going on. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. If uh, if we could move to that last slide, which just uh, just so you get to see something different, and um, <laughs> and, and just a couple of things, you know, this this really is the never ending journey, and and I want to thank Dr. Spalding and Dr. Lattimore for you know every cause needs a champion, and they and the and the DEI committee for for Rotary were the were the champions for us, you know uh, we're making progress uh, as you can hear. Uh, but we have a long way to go. Uh, Dr. Spalding mentioned, well, and Dr. Lattimore too, that we just had orientation. And I, and I counted it up because one person was not there, but we just had 11 new members join our club and we did orientation for them. And out of 11 people, we had five African-American men, one Latina uh, and five white, uh, uh, white people. So um, it, it, that, that is pretty uh, amazing to see. And again, I think a lot of that is just because we are now more aware. And, and part of your work uh, with the DEI committee was to tell us to go out and look for people that don't look like us that might be good Rotarians. And, uh, and that's already having some great results for us. So we're making progress. But we have a long way to go. We're, we're never going to get there because it, it, it truly is a journey that, that never ends. Um, um, but I, I, I hope we've shown that, that we, we can do that. And I, I love that Maya Angelou uh, um, quote, you know, when you know better, you do better. And, and after many, many years, uh, I think our journey probably started 32 years ago when the first woman was, uh, was uh, joined the club. And, uh, and, and it has gotten progressively, but now with a great deal of emphasis, uh, we're taking those next steps. Um, one of the things I really did want to talk about was ripples. Um, you know, it, this is not just about rotary um, uh, for me, and, and, this is, and that's really, I didn't really explain that, but why we chose to submit uh, for this conference is because we're all members of clubs and, and groups uh, and, and we can have a ripple effect all across that. Um, uh, certainly the work that Hood Seminary has done over the years, Dr. Spalding, uh, you, you know, you've led the, uh, the DEI efforts at, uh, at, uh, at the community college and, and across the state and beyond. And now because of your good work, uh, those ripples have helped the uh, an, an, at one time all white Rotary Club to do better. And, and I think we're all in a position to do that in the clubs and, and the organizations, that where, whether it's a church or a civic organization or our workplace, uh, we're all in a position to have an impact and, and to let those ripples flow out all across um, uh, wherever, we, uh, wherever we touch. Uh, and, and I would, uh, in these last few minutes, um, if anybody wants to put in the chat, uh, you know, um, uh, what what clubs or, or church groups um, are you a member of where you see this could be applicable to you? In other words, it's not just our work. Uh, in, I mean, it's just not the Rotary Club of Salisbury, but where do you see this as somewhere that it might work for you? Um, 
Oh, there, there's one that already popped in. Law enforcement um, uh, uh, would be a great place. Uh, obviously, a workplace, uh, and certainly a, a most important place for for uh, for this kind of work. So, thank you, uh, Ted, for that. I do want to say, um, you know, we appreciate the nine. There are nine. Well, 80, well, 88 now, but nine. There were ninety-one people on this. Uh, call. Um, I, I'm very uh, heartened by that and surprised that people would choose us over some other session, but I'm, uh, it's, you know, it's gratifying. Um, and I want to thank the uh, college and the guide committee for the second year of this outstanding effort. Uh, it's one of the more public ways that we can make an impact, and we're glad to be inclusive in bringing in the Rotary. So I wasn't, you know, I mean, I didn't, I didn't submit. It was Ted. So I was very happy to see uh, that support coming from the club, from the president's level. Uh, and very happy to see the great work that's being done yesterday and today. So um, I guess, Ted, if you'll close us out, we can um, declare victory today and uh, just thank everybody for being here. Thank you all. And yes, to have uh, um, uh, uh, 88, now 91 folks, I, I expect some folks are coming on for the next session. So they get a, a little extra also. Uh, but we had 88, I think, through our entire session, which is great. So thank you all for um, for being a part of this. Uh, I, I see, uh, uh, is it Nikita Eubanks just said people want to be in a place of being accepted and not just tolerated. Rotary has opened the door to acceptance and inclusivity, great job. Thank you very much for, for that. Um, you know how to get to us uh, otherwise, and if, and if anybody has any other questions, please feel free to, to put them in the chat. Otherwise, I think we can declare this, uh, this complete. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you. It's been great. All right. Thank you very much, President Goings, Dr. Spalding, and Dr. Lattimore, for bringing these these to bring to a platform like this. Uh, these challenges that not only affect our community but communities all over the country is an excellent presentation. We appreciate your time today. All right. Best wishes. Thank you, Dale. Hello, everyone. We're excited to get started with our next presentation for the guide conference called "The Invisible Employee." Before we begin, I wanted to cover some housekeeping items. Please leave your cameras and your microphones muted throughout the session. And if you have any questions, we want you to use the Q&A feature. We will get as many of the questions answered as we can at the end of the session. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Rochelle Newton. She's a black woman in IT. Dr. Newton has experienced many of the challenges of being a black or brown woman in the workplace. In 2017, she created a group of technicians across the entire organization in that structure to work through what she calls wicked problems. In the process, the group became a diverse group who advocated for each other. This is probably the work she is most proud of. In 2015, she formed a small group to examine food insecurity. The group was eventually absorbed into the larger community and the work continues today. Dr. Newton is a committed, dedicated and organized leader. She brings her best to her work every day. She believes in team building and employee career pathing. Dr. Rochelle Newton has created numerous communities to advance diversity. She serves on many boards. She is best known for her collaborative and diversity efforts. She hosts diversity chats, and these chats are the experiences and stories of everyday people as they live, play, and work. To date, she has hosted more than 200 of these chats. We discuss issues of gender, poverty, and race through those chats, and I'll be placing the link to those podcasts in just a moment. Dr. Rochelle Newton also founded Newton Advocacy and Strategic Inclusion and Tolerance Consulting, NASITC, in 2020. Dr. Newton 
and NASITC, has more than 40 years of advocacy and people development. The organization provides four services, branding, which is to help individuals find their best career based on experiences, goals, and interests. The second is people development, helping organizations recognize, retain, and support employees. The third is recruitment referral, and this is a free and very low cost service that she offers to colleagues and those in the network trying to hire hard to find talent. And the fourth, which we'll experience today, diversity training. The organization provides training and tools to help diversity officers improve organizational culture. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Rochelle Newton to our forum today to share with us, entitled the presentation, The Invisible Employee. Dr. Newton. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that introduction. Um, may I use my camera or no? Absolutely. We want to see you and experience you fully. And you also have screen sharing capability to share your presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, in addition to this presentation, I am joined by my co-podcaster, Drew Stennett. Uh, Drew and I uh, do a weekly podcast uh, called Eminent Technology, and we talk about the impact of technologies, mostly on marginalized groups, but we also talk about the impact of technology on all of us. Drew is a VCU graduate. He is also a systems analyst at Duke, which is how I came to know Drew. Um, he has worked in technology uh, since finishing college, and he specializes in all things Linux and DevOps. But I will say he specializes in a lot more than that, but he's pretty moderate, modest. In his spare time, Drew is a horror film aficionado. Um, I won't go into the details of that and how that relates to what we're going to talk about today, but I think it's very important to know that he has expertise in that area. He was a theater major at one time and did some work in the theater, so uh, I'm sure Drew will share a lot with us today. So Drew, if you are here, please turn on your mic and your camera and say hello. Yeah. Uh, hey, everybody. And uh, uh, also, thank you, Rochelle, for that introduction. Uh, I'm uh, very happy to be able to do this with you and uh, very much looking forward to it. And I uh, also want to shout out Rochelle's uh, diversity chats. Like um, they're just very uh, informational and very humanizing and they're incredibly useful. So I would definitely recommend everybody take a take a look at those. Thank you so much, Drew. So the title of our presentation is the invisible employee or invisible employees. Uh, typically, when we work in an organization, we work in an organization for some of the most basic things, right? For experience, pay, co collaboration, you know, the things that you get when you go into a place where there are people that are different from you. But one of the problems with these types of organizations and these types of, of communities that are created within an organization is that they're often, often splintered. Often employees don't know if they are doing a good job until they get their biannual or annual performance review. And oftentimes that review is not attached to any kind of uh, remuneration that looks like, okay, I'm doing a really great job or they recognize me. And so what happens in this case, specifically in communities that are underrepresented is there's a feeling of, do I belong? Where, where do I fit into this organization? And so I am going to share, uh, she says I can share my screen. I'm going to share a small presentation Drew and I put together for you. Uh, and uh, see if you can see this here. Drew, can you see my screen? Yep. Yes. Excellent. So the, the idea that I am at work, I, I arrived at work at 8 a.m. and I am there until five or six o'clock but yet still I'm not visible, you don't see me. And how is that possible? So physically I'm sitting in a chair or standing at a desk, I'm meandering through the office, getting coffee, talking with my colleagues, but yet I'm invisible. As a black woman who has worked in IT for a long time, and IT is information technology, for those of you who do not know what that is, but I'm sure you all do, information technology for a long time. and. Uh, I struggle even to this very day 
with belonging in a place where I was told I did not belong, that I don't have any value here. And so I want to start with the things that actually define invisibility. And one is a seat at the table. And that does not mean I can come to a meeting and sit down. It means that I get to participate fully in the meeting as everyone else does. So I get to ask questions, provide input or feedback, suggest ways that we can do things better, things like that. A voice. So now can I interrupt the speaker? Can I tell the person who is leading the meeting that they may have gotten something wrong or that's not how I understand it? A voice and not have that any of my actions be punitive. So in other words, I'm not gonna be written up or uninvited from the next meeting or whatever. Organizational culture. If you look at your organization and from the top to about the middle, it's white in the leadership, and white male, white female. That culture does not suggest inclusion. If you are going to bring people to your organization and you want them to help you, which is why you hired them, to help you improve or increase your productivity or functionality, your structure needs to be as diverse as it possibly can. And that's just not black, brown, and red, but, but diverse in terms of the skill sets that people bring, diverse in, t- in terms of experiences, where you grew up, all of that. If everybody in the front looks alike, your thought process is alike. And you can see that in lots of decisions. And I'll give you a couple of good examples. If you remember in 2015, when Google announced its facial recognition software, Every time it saw a person of a certain hue, it would put up a picture of a gorilla. That's organizational culture that has failed immensely. And I would gather Google did not intend to do that. That's just the problem when you think, and back in my day, we used to call that group think, but when you think things through that this is the way it's supposed to be because we all share a common belief, philosophy, ideology, or whatever it is, and we act upon it. The next is opportunity. So how often or how likely am I going to have an opportunity to grow within this company? Am I paid fairly? And I can tell you probably 90% of the companies that exist in America can speak outside of America, do not pay their employees fairly. And then can I be promoted fairly? So thus you have invisible employees. So I would like to ask Drew to talk to us a little bit about what is a typical day in an employee's life and how do we address invisibility? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Thank you, Rochelle. Uh, So like working in the IT field, um, I think a a lot of times people see invisibility almost as a good thing. And it's because when you're in the IT world, you don't want to make a name for yourself a lot of times, right? Like IT people tend to like keep the lights on, right? Like I want to keep the lights on. I want to keep my head down. Uh, A lot of times I think back to a uh, previous job I had where I would consider, I would have considered myself an invisible employee and uh, made like a big mistake, right? Like huge mistake, bunch of stuff went down. It was awful. But like in the back of my mind, I was thinking, well, you know, at least they know my name now. Like, (laughs) At least those higher ups now know that I work for them and uh, and that I do something. And that's sort of like, you know, that's a bad way to make a name for yourself. Right. You want to be known as somebody who's doing good things, not as somebody uh, who's doing bad things. And, you know, when I look out across teams now, like there are there are visible employees and there are definitely invisible employees. Right. There are people that are present on the team, but aren't. Uh, aren't given the opportunity to really have that, uh, that place at the table. Um, and I wanted to sort of speak like as somebody who I feel like in general, I do have a place at the table, but I feel like where, uh, where we could do a lot better is making sure like when you're somebody that has one of these seats at the table, making sure that you're bringing people that aren't at the table to the table because they can't do it themselves. Right. Like, if you're in a uh, meeting and in the IT world, it's a lot of white dudes, right? Like it's our job to be more inclusive. It's our job to uh, to make sure that we help people not to be invisible because invisibility is is not good. Uh, 
I was reading a Gallup poll to sort of prepare for this. And uh, like there are tons of benefits to having non-invisible employees. Uh, the biggest one in this Gallup poll was like there's an 80 percent lower absenteeism rate for folks that are not invisible. And that's huge. Right. Like that's getting people to work. That's a that's a huge benefit. Uh, around 20% higher uh, productivity and profitability. That's another thing. Like it's great for your business to make people not be invisible and to give uh, uh, to give people a voice. And I'm I'm curious, Rochelle. Like, do you ever think like there's no place in business for invisibility? Do you agree there, or do you think I, I, it's hard to find like a a positive thing about being invisible? It seems very very bad. If that's not an obvious statement. Excuse me, Dr. Uh, Newton. I, I apologize for interrupting your presentation. Um, some of the people joining are, are um, asking about the slide deck and if it should be changing. We, we are only seeing your presenter view, not not the main view. Okay. So I am sharing my screen. Do you see it now? We do. We're at the very first one. Is that fine? Because yes, that's the good. only screen. I, this is where I want to be on this screen to we move to our next topic. Yes, you're, you're good then. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, Drew, please ask me your question again. Yeah. So is, is there ever a place for invisibility uh, in the workforce? I think what you said earlier about, you know, heads down, you know, you've got a big project, you've got you know, time constraints, budget constraints and all of that. Sometimes you are all invisible regardless of your ethnicity. You're invisible because you're trying to get something done. And one, you don't want people coming in, interrupting you or adding something else to the plate. And two, you are often trying to manage what you have with life going on around. you. So I do think there are times when it's appropriate to be invisible. What, what I'm describing, and I, I think what I'm trying to convey is that when you hire or bring in black and brown people and, and all the ethnicities too, when you bring people in, they have to feel like they are contributing because what happens is there was a study done uh, maybe 10 years ago. And it said that of hundred percent employment, only 12% of that employment do the majority of the work. 33% come in, they log in, they might do a couple of things, but for the most part, they're spinning their wheels. And then you've got that other large number of people who are just there to get a paycheck. And it's because we've created an environment where people do not feel valued. People do not feel like they are a part of the solution. And if you are not including and giving people an opportunity to become a part of the solution, then what happens is you have cogs in your wheels that's slowing you down. So when it's appropriate to be invisible, People should be invisible, but that should not be an ongoing state. That should be something that ebbs and flows, right? So when you move from that big project, you've accomplished everything you, you intended to do, you should be a part of the discussion for what, we, what are we going to do next? We have been in a, in a, in a workplace where we, we trust our CEOs and our leaders and those at the top to make all the decisions. And while that's the structure of what we have lived, lived with for most of our, that's not really ideal. And if you look at the younger people and how they're approaching work, um, I, I don't want to skip around my screens too much, but I want to show you something here that's really interesting. So I quit. This came out of the Washington Post, uh, I think early uh, this year. So Look at these numbers with the number of people who are leaving jobs. And I can't, I haven't been to a single place where there is an I'm hiring sign, including in technology and STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, where there has been a huge benefit to working in STEM, right? Well, good paying, less uh, job loss, all of those things. But even those areas are suffering for people not coming to work or quitting those jobs. This, this slide is startling to me. When I read the article, I was just so surprised at these numbers. And you would think, well, okay, we're in the middle of COVID. There's some understanding for that because you know people left because of the virus, we all went home. But guess who didn't go home? 
the essential workers did not go home. <laughs> they didn't go home. They just quit because their health and other things were at risk. And, and for the low pay, so I think if I remember somewhere, the minimum wage is 7 or $8. And you keep seeing these little flashes of companies saying they're going to pay $15 an hour. But does that uh, consider the cost of inflation? I don't know. So all of these things are things that we need to think about when we have companies that we want to be productive. We want to sell whatever we're selling, do whatever it is that we're doing, and people are not staying with us because we're not creating an environment where you can be productive and visible and have a voice and a seat. So Drew, in the, in the course of workplace, in, the, in your workplace, how do you decide when a project is assigned to someone or when someone is asked for input or, or asked to contribute to a team thing? How is that done in your office? Uh, that's a good question. Like usually, it's usually based on what the person has done before, right? Like if you have a big project, uh, typically you're not going to give that to a uh, person whose work that you're not familiar with, right? Like everybody's got deadlines, everybody has, you know, needs to be met, and you want to give it to the person who uh, you think is going to do it, uh, to do it best, which, like, thinking about it in the invisible employee context, like, that's not a great thing, because if you're not, if you're not giving invisible employees uh, a chance to express themselves and show themselves and show their work, then uh, they stay invisible, and it's, you know, it's a rough never ending, uh, never ending cycle. Absolutely. I, I did a talk for a uh, local chamber of commerce about hiring and there was the talk was on the browning and graying of America. So there's a lot of talk that was in the marketplace prior to COVID. I haven't heard as much about the browning and graying of America lately, but you know, when you go to hire someone and whether you're going to hire a CEO or, or IT analyst or a janitor. If you bring in a mixture from the CEO level, someone from that group, and maybe multiple someones from that group, but also people from that, that lowest part of your organization into that interview process, you get a more well-rounded employee. If you only have the CEO or the C-suite or whatever you want to call it as the people who make the decision, you're going to keep hiring people that are just like that. If you look at most CIO structures, <laughs> the CIO and his or her entire team favor a lot, you know, in terms of ethnicities, beliefs, ideas. And the problem with something like IT, where it is always going wrong, you know, we don't have a day when we wake up and go into the office and everything is firing on all cylinders. Something has failed or gone awry. Well, you need people who think differently to approach those problems. Those wicked problems that persist and reoccur is because we aren't doing a job of bringing in different thought processes, different ideas, different belief systems. Because if you have someone who is a, you know, I wouldn't say, you know, a, a genius, but someone who's really, really smart and head down, worker bee gets things done. That's a great person to have on your organization. But you need to balance that out by the person who's more social, more extroverted, more outgoing, because you build better rapport between people because you have difference. And I often say this, Drew has probably heard me say this, uh, say this a million times. The universe is the most perfect example. Walk outside your door or when you go for your afternoon walk. Tell me how many one kind of trees you see. Is there just one pine tree, one magnolia, one oak, whatever tree you favor, flower, bug, creature? You, the universe is the most diverse thing ever. Even in the pine trees, there are species of pine trees. Snakes, there are species of snakes. Fruit, you know, there are different kinds of peaches and strawberries because the universe understands the need for that diversity. But in our workplace, we seem to think that that is a hindrance to our work. And I think that in many cases, it's why people leave, why people aren't productive, why people don't feel like they are valued, because they are just set in a job and just set there. And I just want to ask a question of our audience. How many of you and people you know have been in the same exact job for 10 years? Not five, but 10 years, the same exact job. That's 
that's an unfortunate set of circumstances because that means you haven't given that person an opportunity to grow and show what he or she can do. 10 years in the same exact job, you may be getting a pay increase. You may be getting uh, bonuses or benefits. You take the day off or something. But if you haven't grown out of your job title, senior director, IT analyst, whatever it is, you are just being worked and almost are invisible. So Drew, I would like to ask you, so in, in the workplace, how often, so from my experience when I, when I was younger, we used to change jobs every two years, then it got to be every five years. What's the turnover rate for getting something new and better now in the workplace? Oh, uh, it depends. So in the tech world, like uh, there's always, the tech world is constantly moving, right? Like tech world is, it's a freight train that is moving whether you're on it or not. And like sort of the best we can do is hopefully grab onto that train and not get like obliterated and tossed to the side. But like, while position titles may not change, like the work changes completely every, I don't know, I would say every five years max, but it's probably like more like two or three years, right? Like just the technology world moves quick. New technologies come out every day. Like the stuff that we're doing right now is going to be as low tech as it's ever going to be for the next forever, right? Because it's only getting better. And I'm sure that's how it works in, uh, in other industries as well. But if you're staying in that, like for whatever I'm doing right now, I do not want to be doing it in 10 years, right? That sounds horrible. Uh, maybe I want to be doing it for two or three years and like five years max. But, you know, people get bored. People want to do, I mean, I think people want to do other stuff, right? You don't want to come in, uh, staple the same papers every day uh, for your entire life because work is work is a huge part of your life, right? It's a third of every day uh, or half if you don't count uh, your sleep time. Right. And, and I think the interesting piece about that with COVID and many of us working remotely now, some companies have put some kinds of mandates in place for people to come back to the office or to work remotely or hybridly or whatever. I think the problem with when you come with these mandates, you take away the power of the people, right? So I talked to Drew about this not too long ago. So back in the day, we used to have this thing, we manage people, managers manage people how can you manage a person? So as you think about this going forward to these invisible employees, you manage what they produce, not them. You manage the work that they do. And if you believe you are managing people, you are not doing your best job. You are making people feel invisible, less valued, less important. It's important that you understand when you are in a leadership role, and that's a manager or supervisor, whatever it is, that's a leadership role. And if you're in that leadership role, you are responsible for those that respond, report to you. And that means their best interest, their well-being, how they're doing. So if it made sense for your company, for everybody to come back into the office, great. But what did it mean for those employees? And I can tell you for me, I live eight miles from where I work, eight miles. I can get there in my sleep. No traffic, nothing, because I'm an early riser. So, you know, five or six o'clock in the morning, I'm at work and there's no one on the road. But for my employer to tell me I have to come back into the office Monday through Friday, waste gas, not good for the environment, waste electricity and all the other stuff it takes to run a br brick and mortar building and have people sitting in a place doing very little work because now you've even further alienated them because when they were there before, before COVID, you know, they were just barely hanging on. And now you put things in place that says you have to. Managing people means being aware of people and their needs. And that old uh, cliche, treat people up like you like to be treated, applies in managers. It applies in leaders. You know, so if you expect to go to the golf course on Friday at two, you can bet your employees have something to do Friday at two. Now, I understand productivity wise, it doesn't make sense for everybody to leave. But Drew, I think we could say this definitively. We showed that we can work remotely. We showed oh, yeah. it with, with everything. The technology showed up, people's responses, people work longer and harder now. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a that's a huge point to make is like work from home. I think there was a big fear that work from home meant like people are just going to sit back on their couch, watch TV, maybe respond to messages. And like, you know, that is not what happened. Like uh, now people, they don't have to worry about that commute. Right. So maybe that hour that they spent getting ready and getting dressed and, you know, going into the office. And now they can just sit on their computer and like start working. And I don't know that that's necessarily a good thing all around, but it's good for productivity. Um, so Rochelle, like, I know you don't like going into the office, which is awesome. But, like sometimes personally, I like going in, like I like going in, I like seeing people, I like uh, uh, going to lunch, <laughs> right? Just like getting out of the house. Uh, but at the same time, I don't want to be told that I have to go back into work either, right? Like it's one of those things where I feel like it should be a choice that uh, you can make. And a lot of it's really going to be based around your personality. And when you compare working from home to working from the office, as far as productivity goes, I mean, I think there's no question that working from home is way more productive nowadays, right? There's just, there's less distractions. Uh, you lose the benefit of uh, human interaction, but you still get like tons of productivity. So it seems, it seems very weird that uh, people would, that people feel the need to force folks back into work and, you know, it happens and it's just, <laughs> we should stop that. <laughs> right. Dr. Because Newton, that yes. We have a question about um, the invisibility with remote work. What are your thoughts? Cause you are talking about, especially when it's not, so, when it's customer service driven and you have to be there where the customers show up, you have to be in the building, but when there is a remote, or teleworking situation that's appropriate. How do those folks um, make sure that they don't become invisible? Well, unfortunately, Zoom has become the way of life for most of us. Uh, so Zoom is one of those ways and, and technology has very, very varying options for that. But I would say probably the way that you're not invisible when you're remote is the interaction with your teams, right? So your communities. I one of the things I believe in is building communities and building your own personal community. So who are the people in your community? So those community members are people you should have interactions with regularly. Like, well, one of the things Drew didn't tell you about lunch. So, you know, before we went to remote, you know, we would go to lunch once a month. The, the criteria was that, you know, we tried less to talk about work and more to talk about each other in our personal lives. But of course, work always creeped in. But it, it's important to find ways to connect with people when you're not physically with them. And that means it may mean a Zoom session, a, a, a FaceTime or whatever Android has, you know, some way to connect and see people and talk to them and to interact. And then for those people who are above you, the leaders, also to check in, you know, so one of the things that Drew said he did, and, and I never did this, but Drew said, you know, throughout the years, he would document all the projects and all the things he worked on through the year. And so he would have these interactions with his leadership about what he's doing. Well, I think that's an ex a wonderful way to not stay invisible. So you, a, a good example of that would be like, okay, so there's new this new project coming out. Everybody received the email that we're getting ready to implement some new security measure. So as the new employee or the invisible employee or the, the youngest employee, when I say youngest, meaning the least experienced employee, could reach out to his or her supervisor and say, hey, I saw this new project come along and I'm really interested in getting involved with that. I would like to have more visibility in this project. And you know, depending on what that person says, if the person doesn't say yes, you can say, well, please make sure that the next time there's something like this, I'd really like to participate in this. And, but if the person says yes, then you have to be a little bit of entrepreneurial and take advantage of that situation. So you find out who the team members are, right? And you reach out to the team members and you say, hey, I spoke to my supervisor and he or she said I could participate. What do you need done? And one of my strong suits, uh, I don't know that I have many, but one of my strong suits is that I don't approach a project as a leader. I approach a project as a part of the team. And so I describe the time, the budget, what we are being asked to do, who are those that are impacted. And I ask, who wants to lead this project? Now, there may be someone there who is more skilled, better able to lead because he or she has worked in this space before. They know all that. But if you ask, you get less resistance to the work. If you tell, you are almost always guaranteed to get resistance. So where you're located may not always be the barrier. If you do feel that you're invisible 
through the digital means, go into the office. If your company allows you to go into the office, go into the office. You know, I always say there's a way to have a wonderful conversation starter, and that's a book club, you know, get people to read something you're reading. Drew is famous for teaching us. Drew gave us a class, uh, was it in the summer on Go? Uh, and Drew, you might want to tell them what Go is. Uh, we got our Kubernetes uh, class from Drew. We got an Apache class. I mean, those are ways to show up and have yourself be there. And so not mandatory to attend, but you might learn something. And people say, hey, he has the skill. He's always trying to make us better. You're no longer invisible. Yeah. And you also just get sort of like more interaction with people from that, right? Like, uh, so I love Go. The programming language is awesome. But like, it's also good to just get in a room or in a virtual room with a bunch of people and uh, and talk about something, even if, you know, not everybody in that room is going to be a Go programmer in, you know, a week or a month or a year, but at least, you know, people get exposed to things. Uh, one thing I wanted to add about the uh, sort of how to not be invisible when you are working remotely, because that's like, it's really hard, right? Like we are now, we're not all getting coffee at the same time anymore. So it's harder to see some people sometimes. Uh, you don't overhear people talking about random non-work stuff because they're in the cubicle next to you anymore, right? Like all of that is gone uh, working from home. One thing that I sort of noticed in myself is uh, when I'm chatting with work folks nowadays, like I was finding people more annoying because it's like, what? this person is like always bugging me about work. Like, why are they always bugging me about work, right? <laughs> like every time I see a message from this person, they're asking me to do something and that is my complete interaction with them. Whereas before when we were in the office, like we talked about tons of stuff, not just work. So I think sort of, you know, trying to flip that, flip that around a little bit. Like if you're finding that, you know, maybe you're being annoying, like me, Drew is always pinging this one person about work all the time, or this other person is always pinging me. Like, you know, maybe you still have to talk to them about work, but, you know, ask them about other stuff as well. Like, you know, check in, see how their family's doing, see, you know, what else is going on. It doesn't, just because we're using a work, chat tool doesn't mean that we only have to talk about work like try and get some of those uh those coffee conversations in virtually because you know it feels good to find out about other people and have other people find out about you as well it sort of sort of greases those work wheels to help keep everybody smiling instead of oh, another message from drew you know what does he want now <laughs> excellent and and i will say about those uh oh, those uh non-work conversations uh what you exercise how you exercise we have a colleague who's a carrot fan you know we learn more about carrots than we want to know but you know they're they're comical and they're also kind of you know they light you up bring a little bit of brevity to the to the experience it's it's an amazing it's an amazing process if we really work at it if we want to go with the status quo we can repeat what we've done for hundreds of years very easily we don't need to do anything different you know whether you're in person or not I want to add this, though, you know, like, so I'm an introvert. I am a natural inter introvert. And I know a lot of introverts fall, find themselves in IT because it used to be a very, you know, closeted kind of work you did. People just thought you were like, you know, savages and they just threw meat into a dark room and closed the door and hope you fix whatever problem it was. Of course, it's all evolved to a more humanly kind of way to see IT. But in reality, you know, like, people who are introverted are just as engaging as people who are not. It's just that they don't seek out engagement first. You either engage with them or something comes along that they want to share or something, but that's basically it. But that does not necessarily prohibit people from being invisible. If you're an introvert and you tend to like to be left alone and left by yourself, you still have to in, engage with the work process and engage with your colleagues and 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 that does not change where you are you still have to engage how you engage, how you engage is what has changed for us now because of covid and what is the new normal none of us know you know so there's so much misinformation out there that it's hard to know where we will be this time next year or the year after but what we can do is work to see ourselves more humanly. We can work to see ourselves, see each other as humans and do that every single day, put in that work. So I'm gonna go to my next slide. Um, I think you may have seen it, but uh, well, maybe it was the other way around. No, it was there. Okay, so here's things that we know that contribute to invisibility, right? 
when we went to remote work, um, the people who remained on on the streets and in the buildings are people who were paid the least. So the cook, the the gardeners, the janitors, all of these people did not have the luxury of going to work remotely. They weren't given computers and taught how to use Zoom and all of those kinds of the things. They were on premise. And I can almost guarantee you all the discussion we've had today, those people felt like they were on that campus by themselves. So there are no students wandering around. There are no employees coming in and out, but the grass still needs to be cut or the floor still needs to be swept or the trash emptied or food cooked for whomever has to be in the building. Those employees can be reached by one, fair wage, a fair living wage. Two, if they are expected to come on campus, that they are allowed to be off some days. So if they have a Monday through Friday job, change the structure. So they come in Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or Tuesday and Wednesday, and they may work a longer day, but they need to be treated like they're human beings too, not to just, just there to cut the grass or sweep the floor or whatever it is. That's one of the phases of invisibility and how to fix that. And people who do not have a voice or a seat. So those, no one asked those essential workers who had to come into work, did they want to? They didn't get a choice, but they ought to get a choice in how they work and the time that they work and how they divide up their day. So whether you're a nurse, a doctor, a janitor, whatever you are, you still ought to have some say, because as you said, this is a third of your life and most of your waking hours. So there's another, another eight hours after you get off at five o'clock that you're awake and whatever, unless you're again insomnia or something. But for the most part, the, and you don't have any say so about what's happening to you, except for you have to go to get that paycheck to pay for your family's well-being. We need to think about that a little bit. Give them choice. So if there are 55 million, so America is somewhere 308, 10, 3 million people. So if 55 million people are essential workers and in essence invisible, that's a fourth of us. We who are in better positions should care about that because in that old saying, sooner or later it could be you because when they come for the IT people, if no one spoke, they're going to go. And when they come for the accountants, no one's going to go. When they come for the CEO or the CIO, no one spoke. We're all going to eventually end up that way if we don't put humanity in how we interact with people. That's it. I'm going to tell you something. I grew up extremely poor. I didn't have food, didn't have clothes, grew up in rural South Carolina. $7.25 would have been like we won the lottery. It was a lot of money. $7.25 today, go buy a loaf of bread and a gallon of milk. You need more than $7.25. And you've got to pay rent and all the other things that have gone up because of COVID, before COVID, after COVID supply demands, you know, all of these things existed in some form before, but we still didn't see it was necessary to pay people more than the minimum wage, and yet we wanted them to succeed. And what's really telling about that is the people who are most likely subjected to these lower, below living wage are black and brown and red, period. And if we want people to be productive and to be a part of a, a, a continuing society, we must give them opportunities to participate fully. When you don't have clean water, when you don't have running electricity, when, when all of these things are questions that you have to deal with every day and you have to go to work. And think about our, our children in school. So the digital divide has been highlighted in a way that it had never been when COVID hit. So kids learn to use hotspots, kids learn how to navigate Zoom and all these things, what's happening in the background and mothers and fathers doing homework and children sharing things because there's only one in the house. To be invisible, it just, you could almost translate it into being poor or not having an opportunity to fully participate. The cost of inflation, well, you all know you were experiencing that too, right? How about gender? 51% of men are these essential invisible workers and women are 49. Not much gap in that number. 
So that means all of us. And to be clear, essential workers are not just those people we talk about, the janitors and the people who cook and clean and all that stuff. We all are essential workers because you wouldn't be in your job if you weren't essential because they don't hire excess people just for the sake of hiring them. They have everybody there that they think they need to run their organization. The problem is, is we just don't experience the way people who are on the other side of the economic gap. So Drew, in, in, in looking at our society and how we've dealt with these things, do you see a correlation between being invisible and mental health? Uh, oh yeah, like absolutely, right? Like everybody, I mean, having a sense of well-being is a huge part of mental health, right? Like everybody needs to feel a sense of, uh, one thing that always comes up in our chats is belonging, right? Like everybody needs to feel like they belong where they are, whether it's belonging at school, belonging in your workplace, belonging like on your team itself. Like, you know, all of that has a, a strong impact on your mental health and, you know, mental health also has a strong impact on your physical health. So, you know, you, you just have to, it's something that you have to take care of and that we have to take care of uh, with each other as well, right? Like there's a, a comment on the chat, which is a great point about how uh, some people are talking more on Zoom now than they were in the office because a lot of us are heads down and we're introverts and that's the way that we have to be. And, you know, that's great. Like that's, uh, it's awesome that you can talk more like that. Uh, the only thing that I would maybe add to that is if you're one of those people that is not, you know, always head down and maybe more of a social person. It's sort of uh, when you see folks uh, head down, you know, doing their work, doing awesome work, like let other people know because they may not be the ones that do it themselves. And Rochelle, this is a one of the many lessons that I've learned from you is like, send a note to their boss, right? Like say, you know, this person, they're not going to, they're not going to brag on themselves, right? They're not going to uh, go out of their way to talk about how awesome they are. But you can, you know, do that for them and not just to the person directly, but to the people that are that are managing them and the people that really uh, that really need to know. Absolutely. And, and I think that it's important for us to all, all realize that our mental health has been changed. And a lot of times we don't know it. like these minor bouts of depression or uncertainty and all these things. All of these things are happening to all of us. Most of us recover and, and bounce back and keep right on. Some of us do not. So we have to make sure we're creating a work environment that allows people to thrive and be well and have minutes and days and hours and weeks and years where they are constantly assessing themselves and being able to speak freely about what they find. Dr. Newton? Um, yes? Um, I wanted to make sure that this comment um, got to you. Um, it came in uh, to the host and the panelists um, from uh, Steve and Mac. And it, it is a comment, but it, it definitely dovetails well with what you're sharing now. Visibility has now become an issue of education to produce opportunity for invisible workers. So right in line with what you're saying. And I know we only have just about three or four minutes left, but um, I'd like to acknowledge um, Stephen Mack's comment to you. Thank you very much. And I, and I absolutely agree. Education is a part of that invisibility. And that gets to the point where, you know, it's, it's either, the reason why I didn't go there, because this is one of those rabbit holes you go down and you might not make it out. But, you know, like, so what kind of school did you go to? Did you go to a community college? Did you go to a four-year college? Did you go to a historically Black college? Where did you go? And then there's some correlation with that. You can track that back to application tracking systems, ATS. You know, when you apply for a job, you go into a queue and never hear anything ever again. It's like you, you more invisibility. I'm just more invisibility. But thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. On the screen, you will see uh, a, a, a little summary of uh, some questions from the Invisible Book uh, produced by John Wiley. If you answer any of these questions, you need to think about this. And if you are a supervisor or a leader in your organization, you need to think about how you apply this to your employees. So the one that really stood out to me is that you have no idea what's going on in your organization. You know you work for 
a, a paper manufacturer and they make paper, but what they're doing, you don't know. That's an invisible employee. So I really encourage you all to think about your employees. Think about the people you work with. Think about your friends. Think about and find out how they're feeling about where they are in their career. Because if not, we're going to have more and more people leave the workplace. We're going to have a mess of things trying to be a superpower as we once were if we don't have people who are in, included integrated and feeling like they are valued. Thank you. So I'll leave this time for any questions that you may have, or if there's something else that uh, I can answer for you, but I, I give my time back to the uh, panel. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Newton, excellent job. Drew Stennett, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Um, we I don't see any uh, questions or co other comments right now, um, but I did. I, I gained so much from what you shared uh, that I did put your podcast link in the uh, chat for all of our participants today, which were up to 117. I also placed uh, the link to the quiz or to the uh, guide for answering those questions um, to see if indeed you may be an employee who's feeling invisible um, and, and some tips and ways to become um, more seen in the organization. Um, I do have one will you, question. Will you, will you also put my diversity chat link in there too? Yes, I will take try and find that. Um, I do know that this is going to be recorded and sent to everyone. And there will also be uh, some slides. If you'll share your presentation uh, with Shivy Williams, we'll make sure we include uh, these links as well. Um, I, sent, I sent them to her yesterday. Perfect. Uh, Dr. Newton, one question for you here. Um, how long should someone stick around before a promotion? You spoke to the transition between positions and, and uh, companies, but can you speak to that? I think uh, what Drew said, you know, like five years, like, so when I left Duke, I, I retired from Duke uh, this August. When I left Duke, uh, I had been from 20, 2008 until 2020, the senior manager for infrastructure, security, and operations. The same exact job type. I had done a whole bunch of different things. I am the chief security officer or the chief data officer, all these other things, but that's what my title was. You have to find out whether it's comfortable to have that title. I'm not a title person. I just want to be able to be seen for what I've done. Um, so it, it just depends. But I would say that if you're in the exact same job and you're doing the exact same thing, you're writing uh, uh, Python programs or, or, or C++ programs or you're a web designer and you're doing the exact same thing, you haven't gained any skill, you're doing yourself a disservice. Your skill set, you should add something new to your tool bag every single year. Your tool bag should add something else. And one of the reasons why I love Drew so much is Drew is constantly putting stuff in his tool bag and everyone else's tool bag. Whether you want it or not, whether it's helpful to you, whether it helps advance your career, makes you more money, that's up to you. But I always say it's, also, it's important to be entrepreneurial. It's important to think about ways to grow yourself because Literally, you most states, North Carolina and most states are right to work, which they can wake up in the morning and fire you just like that. If you haven't gotten anything new in your two bags since the day you started, you might be in a bad way. Great point. Great point. Thank you so much, Dr. Newton. We have come to the end of our time, but I love conversations that continue and that get us uh, to more thinking and that get all of us to a place where we see each other, literally see each other. I appreciate you and uh, uh, Drew Stennett, thank you for what you've added. Um, great people bring along great people. So we're glad to have had you with us today. Uh, thank you again. And we are going to transition uh, to the next portion of our guide conference. Thank you to all of our participants and please uh, stay here right in the, uh, in the webinar Zoom link for for the next presentation and we'll also show you some of the breakout options. Thank you so much. All righty, well, good afternoon and welcome to the last session of the webinar, which is we're very, very excited to, to share with you. And hopefully, uh, since we're at the last session, I hope you have all enjoyed all the sessions. I know I personally feel certainly more enlightened by the information that I've learned 
and uh, certainly feel better equipped to be effective in diversity, equity, and inclusive issues here at Rowan Cabarrus Community College. So my name is Barbara Cooper, and joining me as my co-moderator is Jay Taylor. And so we have the pleasure of moderating Building an Inclusive Environment. And as you can see, it's a student panel discussion. So we're pretty excited about that. And at Rowan Cabarrus Community College, we recognize the importance of engaging our students in, our, in discussions. And what better way uh, to engage them in the conference by including them and inviting them uh, to the conversation on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So. I have the pleasure of introducing to you our two students. Uh, first, we have Mike Rummage, and Mike is a student ambassador for our college, and his program of study is information technology, information systems. And then we have Justin Davis, who is our student government association membership officer, and his program of study is mechanical engineering technology. And they're going to share a little bit about themselves, and then Jay is going to present uh, the key question for our session today. And then we're gonna have about 10 minutes towards the end where we're gonna open it up for Q&A for you to present questions to them. So this is intended to be an interactive session. So we invite you to engage. And now I'll hand it over to Jay. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining our session, Building an Inclusive Environment. I wanna welcome Justin and Mike and ask them both to give a brief introduction. Tell us a little bit about yourself and let's begin with Justin. All right, thank you, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Okay, just wanna make sure. Yes. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, so I'm Justin. Um, like Barbara said, I am excited to be a part of our student government this year um, as membership officer. Um, I too was an ambassador, actually my first year at RCCC, uh, just like Mike. So went from ambassador to now doing SGA. Um, yes, my uh, program of study is mechanical engineering. That kind of, that interest kind of started um, my first few years of high school, looking into technical drafting, those, those types of things. And right now I'm really interested in looking into how to become some kind of CAD operator, um, 3D, solid modeling, AutoCAD, SolidWorks. I'm not sure if anyone uh, is familiar with those types of softwares, but um, that's where I'm looking to go. So i um, very excited to be a part of this, this final session here. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, Justin. Mike? Hi, I'm Mike Romage. As Justin mentioned, I'm a student ambassador for Rowan Cabarrus, um, also in the information technology program set to graduate this coming May. Looking forward to that. Uh, I've actually recently picked up a job in information technology, so already kind of pursuing the direction my degree is headed. And uh, I'm 36 years old, father of three, married, um, and I appreciate the invitation. I'm glad to be here. Thank you both for joining us. Now I'm gonna pose the question. From your personal experiences, please share what suggestions you would offer to the attendees for them to consider when building upon a diverse, equitable, and inclusive academic or work environment. And Justin, we'll let you answer first. All right, so the first thing I'd like to kind of talk about is transparency. Um, what I mean by that is how you're viewed by others. So I'm thinking more of a, from a perspective of a supervisor, manager, like Dr. Newton earlier um, mentioned. So somebody that's in charge of some other folks, right? Um, so transparency, how you're viewed by other people. Um, are you, how are you communicating with, with your team members? How are you, um, are you holding yourself accountable to, to, your, to your actions? Are you the type of supervisor that um, people are comfortable around? You know, when you're, when you're in their presence, are they comfortable around sharing their opinions and ideas? Or are they a little more hostile, a little bit more timid, a little bit more contained? Um, not sure how to exactly read you um, just yet. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, so opening up is what I'm saying. So opening up, um, that just melts the ice in the room, breaks the ice, relieves the tension, right? Um, and those are, I feel like the first few steps to creating an inclusive environment is when everyone's comfortable, everyone feels like the words that are gonna come out of their mouth will hold somewhat value. Um, and that all comes down to how, as, as a leader, how comfortable people are around you. 
So being transparent, um, honesty, those, those types of things. Um, just another thing is uh, keeping an open mind. Um, where I mean, we're all different. If, if we were all the same person with the same thoughts, beliefs, opinions, life would be pretty easy. <laughs> but that, that's not the world we live in, you know? Um, I mean, no, that it's a huge melting pot, right? Um, so keeping an open mind, um, let's say you're in a team oriented, uh, position or, 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 um, workforce and, you know, a decision needs to be made. Um, a, a, a good way to including everybody is considering everyone's opinions. Doesn't mean that everybody's opinions or thoughts are going to be right. But when you make the effort to show that, Hey, like you're here, you're not just another employee. You're not just another number you know, we're, we're valuing your, your time here. Um, so what your, what, what opinions you have are, are also important. Um, and just one more thing kind of tying into, um, creating more an, an equitable space as well. Um, being a part of student government and student life overall at Ron Cabarrus, we've done, um, numerous, uh, personality assessments, um, because in order to, to, to give everyone what they specifically need to be better off and successful, you have to know what you have to give, give that person, right? So communicating with them, asking, you know, reaching out and asking, again, if you're a supervisor, manager, whoever, reaching out and, and, and asking, how can I best serve you? You know, what do I need to assign you? Um, you can think of equity as literally giving some people um, specific assignments that suit their specific skill sets. Which obviously that'll be different across across the team. Um, so that's just you know a final thing I wanted to kind of touch on is you have to first know what everyone brings to the table in order to know what to how to best serve everyone else. Absolutely, thank you, Justin. Transparency, open mindedness, and equity—all important, uh, all important components in a good workplace environment. Thank you, Mike. Um, well, Justin mentioned honesty and, uh, oh, real quick, Justin, I like your background. <laughs> um, he mentioned honesty and I think that's a really big component to, uh, having an equitable educational environment or workplace either way. When you're choosing people who are going to be on your team at work or, or are going to be hired for a certain position, uh, we as human beings are really good at telling ourselves what we want to believe. So it's easy to think, well, you know, we didn't hire this particular female for an IT position, for example, as I work in IT, because she uh, wasn't a good fit with the team or something to that tune when it's more to do with, you know, someone's not necessarily comfortable with working with women. And that's one of the things that exists in IT is a big uh, gender disparity between men and women in the IT fields. Um, and so we're, we're good at kind of telling ourselves, rationalizing our own biases. And uh, so we, we kind of have to be aware of those preconceived notions as like hiring managers or managers in general, um, everyone really. Um, be aware of those biases and do our best to consciously battle against them. Um, kind of be cognizant of the fact that uh, our teams, be it at school, at work, wherever we are, uh, if you'll forgive sort of a loose metaphor, can be sort of like an investment portfolio. You diversify your investments for the same reason you diversify your team. Everyone has different strengths. And when you hit a task where one person is particularly weak, if, if every person on your team has that same level of skill or those same skill sets as that one weak person, then, then your whole team is weak. Whereas if you have diversified uh, skills amongst everyone on your team, different people from different backgrounds, different cultures, then when one person is weak, another person is gonna fill the gap there and make the entire team stronger. Thank you, Mike. I like that. Diversifying your employee portfolio. Very good observation. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, Justin, for your input. And now we will open it up for questions. I saw an earlier comment um, asking about the specific personality assessments. Um, I can find the link. I don't know if I can just put them in the chat or. Yeah, that would work. Absolutely. Okay. 
All right, we have a question here and it says, how does an inclusive classroom environment look to you? Justin, you go first. That's a good question. Um, that's actually something just due to time, I, I uh, didn't bring it up, but um, so that's something I've actually thought about with me being a student currently, something that looks inclusive to me in terms of classroom setting is how well um, teachers are using their, their classroom space. Are you just lecturing from the front, the, the whole class? Um, I know sometimes you don't have a choice but to be up front um, and to teach from there, but you should really seize any opportunity you have to move around. I know as a student, um, you know, if I'm wanting to zone off or, or you know, my brain just kind of is, is not in the, the um, current topic or conversation and the teacher is, you know, kind of getting closer to me or other students um, while they're teaching, it automatically brings me back in and keeps me engaged with the um, the, the topic that everyone's talking about. So um, that's what I think an inclusive classroom looks like to me is a teacher that is walking around, again, raising everybody's sense of belongingness, reminding them that they're there um, and they're, they're playing a part. Thank you, Justin. Mike? Well, kind of got two points I want to bring to you because my initial thought of the inclusive classroom was, was quite literally who's included in the classroom. Um, and from that perspective, you know, I think that it needs to be anyone who wants to be there, regardless of financial ability, that sort of thing. Um, but then the things that Justin said also kind of got me thinking about the way that a, an instructor approaches the class. Uh, I have an autistic son and, and the way that you instruct someone, for example, with autism versus someone who's neurotypical is very different. And so if, if a teacher is, like Justin said, just kind of preaching from the front of the classroom, they're missing several of their students. Those students are not learning. They're just present. And uh, I think to include those uh, neurodiverse students in the classroom is important. And so the, the teaching styles have to accommodate for those differences among us. Excellent point. And as diverse as we are, we also have diverse learning styles too. So thank you for pointing that out. A um, couple of questions from the chat. What is it you need to feel a sense of belonging on your campus? Justin, start us off. Um, so I automatically feel like I belong in a place as soon as my talents or skills are like being of use, um, which is another reason why I'm so glad that I hopped on the, the um, hopped into student life. Uh, um, shameless plug, but but something that we we did um, uh, this year, something that was brand new, was was a podcast, a student life podcast, which me and our president, SJ president Jasmine uh, Rosenberry, she um, is the host, and, and I'm the co-host. But being able to be on campus, be a student, you know, dive into my career, but in addition to that, also tie in some of my um, own personal skills. Um, into doing the podcast. So I'm doing more like the editing, like the backdoor stuff. Um, I'm into music production as well. That's just a, a hobby of mine making music. So like the outro music was music that I made. So that's, it's awesome. It's a win-win for, for everybody. So that's how I feel like, you know, I, I belong on campus when my skills are being of, of use. Thank you, Justin. Mike? I think Justin really hit it on the head is uh, the, the feeling of, of inclusiveness is, is where you feel like your contributions are noticed and appreciated no matter where you are, whether it's in a workplace. Um, as a remote student, I do most of my classes online. So the on-campus part is a little less, uh, I guess, relevant to me. But I think of it like kind of similar to how I think of being in the workplace. Um, I started a new IT job actually just last week. And uh, everyone that I've met in the office has been really welcoming. And the, the things that I bring to the table have been sort of uh, acknowledged, recognized by those people. And I think even on a campus where you have uh, instructors and faculty members noting the contributions of students or each other, uh, that really is important. Thank you, Mike. And yes, acknowledging someone's skill set is very vital. Our next question. What suggestions would you give to a first generation student, parents uh, did not complete college on getting through college, the college process, the admission process, registering for classes, et cetera? Justin? Hmm, that's, a, that's a good one. Um, 
so I had looked up like exactly what a first generation student was. And it was looking like um, it, it, it meant, you know, you're the first person to achieve a four year degree. I'm not sure how exactly accurate that is. I think first generation college student is anybody, anybody that goes to college for the first time and their family. But um, I, I'd say just to, for, for people, for people like that, they don't have something to fall back on. There's people at your campuses who, whose jobs, you know, that that's their job. So reaching out to, again, student life, reaching out to advising, there's so many opportunities that are on campus. You just have to, you know, go out and, and find them. So there's definitely departments and people that, again, that that's why they wake up and drive to campus. It's their job to, to help you out. So using the resources on your campus is a is a good thing. Okay, Mike. Um, yeah, I'm kind of along the same vein with Justin here. Is I'll definitely leverage those resources. Um, coming back to school at 36 years old was kind of awkward for me. So I wound up doing a lot of asking questions. What do I need? What don't I need? Um, and, and talking to the advisors and the people in registration to get those questions answered. One of the best things in the world you can do is ask questions. Uh, my father used to say, there's no such thing as a dumb question. So if you don't know, you need to find out, ask the question, find out who has the answer, get that answer, and then leverage it to your benefit. And uh, you know, invest whatever time, whatever effort it takes to get through that barrier and, and be that, that first generation. That's right. You don't know what you don't know. So you have to use your voice and ask. And, and I'll just piggyback and say it's important to network when you're on campus as well. There's so many people here that are that are here to help you. All right. Next question. What can math instructors do to create an inclusive class? Justin? So that, that's a that's a pretty good one. I'll probably have to think about that one a little bit more, maybe even like past this meeting. Um, because my my math instructor for, for calculus and calculus, that's you know, you know, that's not an easy subject. Um, but she's very good with uh, opening up the opportunity to hop into like her office hours and, and things like that. So I never feel completely abandoned with whatever like material we're currently learning. Sure. Um, so definitely um, because math is something that a lot of people don't just, you know, hop right on. So increasing the, the opportunity that they have to understand the material, whether it's just one-on-one, -on -one, cause that's what I do with my teacher sometimes, just one-on-one, -on -one, you know, help um, definitely is, is beneficial. Thank you, Justin. Mike? That one really kind of kind of stumped me. Um, I'm in a pre-cal class right now. And uh, when I was in high school, math was like a foreign language that I just could not wrap my head around. Um, and then actually coming uh, the first time I went to college, uh, taking college level math classes, something clicked in the way that that instructor presented it and had those office hours where I could come in and say, you know, why are all these letters mixed in with my numbers or whatever? Um, that opportunity to get one-on-one -on -one with the instructor, like Justin said, that makes a big difference because then they can address your individual concerns instead of trying to make blanket statements for a whole classroom. Uh, I think that an instructor offering that that office hours, or if it's a remote situation like I'm in some Zoom meetings or Teams meetings or something like that, that's the equivalent of office hours. That's one of the best things an instructor can do for their students. Thank you, Mike. All right. We have a few remaining questions, but we're, we're going we're gonna to take this as the last one because of time. In contrast, are there things that make you feel excluded or like you don't belong on campus? Justin. Hmm. Um, this too is, is it, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. Um, excluded. So Veronica Bears, I mean, they've done an amazing job in terms of just creating that that um, open environment. You never really feel, you know, abandoned or like on your own. Um, but I guess I, I kind of tap a little bit to get to a little bit more personal. So, so me, due to my re religious beliefs, um, there's there's a lot 
uh, holidays we don't we don't celebrate. Um, so I guess the only thing that I I would say I feel a little excluded on, um, or I, I have to just kind of sit my, myself out on is um, when there's certain events that just kind of um, con contradict with my um, with, uh, with with my beliefs. So I guess that'd be the only thing that I feel somewhat up, uh, uh, apart from. Thank you, Justin. Mike, you want to wrap up for us? Um, I mean, that one, I stumble over that because I really have never felt excluded on campus. All of the, uh, the, the instructors I've worked with have been really uh, helpful with every, every problem that I've had in class. But I can definitely imagine a scenario like Justin mentioned where you feel kind of excluded by uh, certain situations or, or where you can't participate in something due to your beliefs. Uh, that makes perfect sense. But I've, I have not felt that myself. Um, but I think that there's, uh, if people are feeling that, there's definitely some room for improvement there for us to find a way to re-include those people. Thank you, Mike. And I want to thank both Justin and Mike for taking the time out of their day to come and be on this panel for us to uh, learn together, learn more about each other. And these are just two of our shining stars here at Roland Cabarrus Community College. So we thank you very much for your time. At, at this time, I would like to welcome back Jimmy Williams, who is the chair of our Diversity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee for her closing comments. Let me just uh, say thank you to everyone that has um, been a speaker this year and also for those that have attended our second annual conference. But before I um, give this closing <laughs> that I have, I want to first say that yesterday and today we have, we ran into some technical difficulties with Zoom. And so I just first wanna say, I am sorry if you experienced um, your session or as an attendee being kicked out of the uh, session. So hopefully you were able to get back in. Um, we found out and realized what the issue was. And so when we host another conference, we will make sure that does not happen again. So please forgive us for that. But as some of you know, if you've done anything with technology, um, nothing is ever perfect and sometimes there are some some issues that that may happen um, when it comes to technology so on behalf of the diversity and inclusion committee um, we would like to thank everyone for attending our second annual virtual guide conference we hope that you have enjoyed all the sessions you've attended and thank you uh, to all of our presenters and all of you for attending this year's conference I hope that everyone has learned new ideas from the sessions they have attended. Furthermore, I hope the sessions attended during the conference would help further improve your work in the critical area of diversity and inclusion. I know there have been uh, many exciting and valuable presentations over the last day and a half. I believe many good experiences have been shared and lessons learned. As far as the recordings, we will put up all the recordings we have. Um, due to uh, the technical difficulties, there may be some sessions um, that you may want to attend that we don't have the recording for. Um, and if we do, I have already started receiving those recordings and they are in two different um, videos. So we'll have to put them together. Um, but once those videos are or once those recordings are available, we will email everyone to let them know where they can find the links or the link to um, the sessions. I do wanna mention that uh, the Exploring Your Privilege and the 50 Ways to Fight Bias sessions, those were not recorded at all. So if you um, wanted to be a part of those, I'm sorry, but we didn't, those were not recorded um, because these speakers did ask for them not to be recorded. Um, now, also included in, in the email we will be sending out today, or not today, within the next two weeks, we're going to ask that you complete a survey. Once the survey is completed or submitted, we will um, email, you, email you a certificate of attendance for the conference. The survey is anonymous, but there will be more instructions in, in the email regarding completing the survey and receiving your certificate. 
Um, once you give us your feedback on the conference, we just ask that you are honest um, because we want to make sure that we continue to improve the service that we are providing during our conference um, and always want to improve each year. Now, before I complete our close, I want to say thank you to the Brian Cabarrus Community College Diversity and Inclusion Committee and all the volunteers for their hard work to make this uh, conference a success. I also want to say that a great deal of work still needs to be done in the world of diversity and inclusion. However, we are all a piece of the puzzle, puzzle, puzzle to advance diversity and inclusion within and outside of our workplace. So let's make a positive impact on the world by continuing to make changes, carry the torch, and being a light in the world of diversity and inclusion. Now, before I close out, please feel free to contact the Diversity and Inclusion Committee with any positive feedback or questions that you have. I have placed the email address um, on the PowerPoint. And before I close, I just want to have a small conversation. You guys can post these things in the chat. Um, and I want to ask you, so please share in the chat, what was one thing that you learned from the conference that you are willing to share with everyone? So what's one thing that you've, you're taking away from the conference that you thought was great or that you plan to implement um, from the conference? And don't be shy to share. <laughs> so anyone can start. Anyone want to share with us? Thank you for sharing, Jennifer. She said, I have so much more to learn in various aspects of DUI. I have so many takeaways that I can't choose just one. I have 19 pages of notes. Oh my gosh, Jen. Um, I learned so much and I uh, greatly appreciate hearing the student's perspective. Um, pursue opportunity to learn more about equity coaching. Whiteness is not biological, it's an um, exclusionary view of the world which holds that which is which exists to belong, benefit, and distribute to others. These are some great takeaways and some great things that you guys have learned. Um, the meaning of power and honor creates respect. Uh, Surrey Community College is doing amazing work with Latino X students need to scale up statewide. Thank you for saying that. Um, this has been a great conference. Thanks so much. Uh, let's see. I think the quiz on leadership training is something that will need to be used in my work place unit. Um, I am, let's see, I am again reminded of how little knowledge of the issues that so many immigrants face. You guys have learned a great amount. The opening speaker, Dr. Fitzgerald, was amazing. I can't wait to read her book. I took away what I already knew, the importance of pronouns, acknowledgement, and equity. Great, great, great. Um, change office hours to student drop-ins. I'm very surprised to learn North Carolina ranks last out of all 50 states and DC and, and uh, the PR for the best place to live uh, for single working moms. Thanks for sharing that, Misty. Thank you for sharing your feedback and what you learned and what you plan to take away from uh, this, this conference. I really do. Um, and the, the, and the um, committee, we really do appreciate you. Um, and thank you for attending and joining us. And I do want to say this one last thing. You guys, please remember, and I know a lot of you do know, that diversity and inclusion and equity and justice, just please remember that that encompasses a lot, right? It's not just black and white. It's not just race. It's a, it's, it encompasses a lot of different areas, a lot of different individuals, right? Um, religion, um, maybe disability. And one thing I do want to mention, and some of you might type her name if you've ever seen her speak, there is, um, she's a lawyer now, but I heard her on YouTube and I can't think of her name right now, but she is blind, she is blind and she is deaf. And then watch the YouTube video. And one of the things that, um, she talked about in the video um, was an experience that she had. She said she wanted to learn how to surf, 
right? She wanted to learn how to surf. And so she went to different, this was in California, she went to different companies um, and was telling that she wanted to learn how to surf. But they, they did not want to teach her how to surf, right? Because she was deaf and she was blind. Thank you, Jennifer Bohr, for typing that because I knew somebody would remember. Um, because she was deaf and she was blind, and so they wouldn't teach her how to surf. So she, she, right, she um, went to several different companies um, or businesses asking, and, and each time they told her no. And then there was one company she went to and they told her, we have never done that before, but if you are willing to learn, we are willing to try to teach you, right? And so that's what this is all about, right? We have to be willing, first of all, not to give up, right? Not to give up in the fight. Not, don't give up. She did not give up. She really wanted to learn how to, how to serve. She did not give up. And you may hear a lot of no's and people may not agree with you and um, all kinds of negative things may happen. But as long as you, you, you keep moving forward, as long as you strive to Im improve not just yourself, but your community, you will finally get a yes. You will finally get someone that is there to support you. And they're going to be like, yeah, I can help you, right? I can, I can help you. And so this, this company helped her and they, and they learned what they needed to do to teach and to communicate with her on how to surf because she was blind and deaf. And then she was very appreciative and she knows how to surf as a blind, deaf, and deaf individual. So you guys, um, stay, stay with it, right? It's not always going to be easy and it may be difficult at times, but don't give up. And always remember that the best part of DNI is always going to be conversation, right? Conversation. So please be willing to open up and have conversations with individuals and step outside of your box. So again, thank you for attending this year's conference, and we hope to see you next year. Everyone have a great day and continue your hard work in diversity and inclusion. Bye, everybody.